Buenas and half a day. Thank you all for being here. The Committee on Education, Self-Determination, and Historic Preservation, Infrastructure, Border Safety, Federal and Foreign Affairs, and Maritime Transportation will now convene this virtual public hearing. Today is Tuesday, May 18, 2021, and it is currently 11.01 in the morning. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on Monday, May 10th, 2021, and the second notice on Thursday, May 13th, 2021. Notice of today's hearing was also available on the Guam Legislature's website. Joining me today for this public hearing are Senators Mary Camacho Torres, who's also the Vice Chair of this committee, Sen uh, Vice Speaker Tina Munoz Barnes, Senator Tony Yada, Senator Pito Terlahi, Senator Joanne Brown, Senator Tello Taidewi, Senator James Moylan, and I believe that is it. Thank you, colleagues, for being here today. Some general rules of conduct, all must abide by the rules of conduct and quality assurance standards. Please keep your video on at all times and ensure you are, a, you are in a room with little, little interruption and adequate lighting, specifically to make sure the participant's face is visible at all times. The host of this hearing will mute participants and so called, up, called upon by the chair. When called to speak, please ensure that you are unmuted and that you're speaking into your microphone. Questions and testimonies shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any Senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Today's agenda that we initially sent out was to hear in this order bills number 87-36, uh, bill number 59-36 and 83-36. However, there has been a special request that, is sent, that was sent to this committee to accommodate some of the stakeholders in regarding bill number 83-36. So we will entertain bill number 83-36 first, and then we will move on with 87-36 and 59-36. Okay, at this time, I would now like to invite the primary sponsor of the bill, Vice Speaker Tina Munoz Barnes, to introduce the bill. Vice Speaker. Ms. Mossy, um, Majority Leader, Madam Chair, and Manana Sijulis to all our colleagues and all the panel members here this morning. Uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing today. Uh, I, along with Senator uh, uh, James Moylan, introduced Bill. 83-36 at the request of some of our business uh, stakeholders. So last term, a similar uh, measure was introduced as Bill 71-35. I know that uh, last term there was some concerns regarding uh, that bill, Bill number 71-35. So I had committed to working with the administration and DPW to see how we can find a middle uh, ground. What we have today, uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, is a combination of months of work and dialogue between uh, our Lieutenant Governor, uh, our DPW, Guam Contractors Association, and the offices, uh, the Office of Senator Moreland and myself. I would like to enter into the record a letter from our uh, Segundo Magalahi to the President of the Guam Contractors Association sharing the administration's support of the measure, uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you. Uh, for me, um, the logic and reasoning behind introducing this me measure is simple. Right now, we are imposing a higher uh, tariff for big trucks that need to go from the port to local warehouses. Uh, as a result, uh, what could be done in one trip is taking multiple trips ultimately holding the uh, end consumer with these uh, higher costs. And throughout the nation, the cost uh, for raw materials are going up and we must step in before our people once again uh, absorb uh, these costs. And cost of living is high. And while I support the need to protect our roads, uh, what I want to point out is that the measure only impacts halls, roads on Guam. Roads, 
roads that uh, uh, that higher weight trucks will traverse on with the ongoing construction of uh, Camp Blas. The uh, Navy understands the impact of the buildup on our roads and have also committed uh, funds for the reconstruction for um, heavier use, as well as the rehabilitation at, at the end of the buildup. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I want to point out another reason as to why this bill is important. Uh, the body has passed multiple measures last term aimed at reducing the uh, carbon footprint of this island. And we've passed laws requiring energy efficiency, yet we also passed a measure to now use four trucks to do the job of one. We all have seen the impact of um, global warming and the rising fuel costs. And so I, I must say, uh, we must act now. And lastly, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I also want to take the time to thank you uh, and all my colleagues here today who voted unanimously to pass uh, Bill 2 and create a transshipment task force. We saw with the data presented by the World Bank and the United Nations that there is a critical need for improving logistics and supply chains uh, within Asia Pacific. And we see that based on the research, Guam is a prime uh, candidate to house this new initiative and passage of this bill now will only make transshipment much easier to do here on our island of Guam. And we can get uh, bulk goods, take them to a warehouse in Harman, break them up into individual containers, then ship them to its final um, destination. So again, Madam Chair, um, now more than ever, we need to get this done. We need to create, to get creative, lower cost of living, and look at how we can cut the red tape and further device, diversify our economy. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I will note for the record that there may be a technical fix needed to the title, and I hope we can make the correction in the committee. The fiscal uh, note uh, to this, uh, Madam uh, Chair, was also submitted. And uh, in part, um, uh, their concern is um, that the primary concern and major impact of the proposed legislation is to the Guam roads, bridges, and highways, and whether the government of Guam have the ability to pay for the repairs and maintenance of the roads infrastructure that may result with the passage of the proposed changes of the current law. And as I stated in my statement, uh, there, there has been a commitment as, as, um, as the Navy does understand the impacts of the buildup to our roads and, and they have also committed funds for their reconstruction for the heavier use as well as the rehabilitation at the end of the buildup. So I wanted to just make that clarification and reiterate that in my statement. So thank you. I wanna thank again my co-sponsor for, for helping me in this endeavor as we been working on it last term and now this term. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding this meeting today. Sana Masi. Thank you, Vice Speaker. I would now like to acknowledge Mr. Hermi Keha from MBI Guam. Are you, would you like to give testimony on bill number 83-36? Senator Talina Nelson, yes, I would like to uh, present my testimony. Yes. Please proceed. All right. So Senator Talina Cruz Nelson, Senators of the 36th Guam Legislature, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and, uh, and half a day. My name is Hermie Keha and I am the General Manager for Micronesian Brokers Inc., which is an affiliate of the Jones and Guerrero Company. I'm here to provide a written testimony in favor of amending Public Law 33-106 and to express my support for the passage of Bill 83-36. MBI or Micronesian Brokers is a wholesale distribution company which imported approximately 472 containers of consumer goods into our island of Guam last year. For over 45 years, MBI has provided products and services to Guam's food service and retail customers. As a distributor of fast moving consumer goods, we are an, an, an intermediary or middleman for our customer's so supply chain. MBI imports goods from various suppliers, 
stores them in our distribution facility here in Mighty, and then resells them, uh, those goods to our valued customers. We import dry, chilled, and frozen goods on a weekly basis from the US mainland, New Zealand, Australia, and different parts of Asia. For the dry side, we import rice, sugar, canned meat products, UHD milk, and many others. Whereas on the frozen side, we import frozen beef, poultry, seafood, dairy products such as butter and cheese, and a variety of frozen prepared foods. You know, in the logistics world, it can be a good thing to be heavy, particularly when it comes to containerized cargo. Let me explain. In the US mainland, overweight containers are prohibited from traveling on state highways, but they are permitted to travel on designated haul roads. These designated haul roads are located in what is called overweight corridors, or sometimes referred to as green zone. For example, in the port of Oakland vicinity where we port where we export most of our, our containers, the overweight, overweight corridor provides overweight trucks with a route to legally transport cargo containers from a consolidator or freight forwarder to the port itself. Warehouse and logistics centers for freight forwarders and consolidators are strategically located within the green zone. For this reason, MBI primarily utilizes the overweight corridor to consolidate and load its frozen beef products, poultry, and seafood. So the benefits of utilizing the overweight corridor cannot be overstated. And simply put, shipping out of the green zone keeps the cost of goods down. You know, if the weight requirements as mandated by Public Law 33-106 were to be enforced today, Wholesalers would have to reduce the amount of cargo in a container by as much as 15% or approximately 8,000 pounds. Reducing the load capacity in a container would raise prices on consumer goods. Why? Well, simply with a lesser load factor, the freight cost is now absorbed by the fewer products in the container thus across increasing the landed costs for each item. The increased costs for goods will be passed on to retailers and food service uh, operators. And ultimately, you and I, the end consumer, will bear the burden of paying more at the cash registers. You know, for the past two years, I have sat in a committee where the director of Department of Public Works, Mr. Vince Ariola, was present to hear our concerns about the need to update and modernize sections of Public Law 33-106 relative to size, weight, low limitations, and weight, rest weight restrictions for certain vehicles. And I want to truly commend Mr. Ariola for his wisdom and guidance through this process. Hammering out specific sections of the law was such an arduous task for the committee members as it went through various revisions. But with the valuable assistance of the Department of Public Works and Mr. Ariola, as well as various stakeholders and consultants, we prevailed. We finally arrived at the finished product, Bill 83-36. And I wanna thank, especially Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes and her close sponsor, Senator Jim Oyla for sponsoring this bill. Senator Nelson and senators of the 36th Guam legislature, I plead with you to support the passage of Bill 83-36. Remember how invaluable the overweight cor corridor or green zone has been for businesses in the US mainland? It provides truckers with a designated route to legally transport overweight, con car uh, overweight containers. Likewise, Bill 83-36 proposes a similar scenario, namely reclassifying certain major routes on island as designated whole road highways with a reconstructed lane in each direction and with a higher standard design 
allowing, allowing for the movement of heavier containers and vehicles. Senators, allow me to pose a question. What is the alternative if this bill lacks your support? As an importer, let me share with you the adverse effect they'll have on consumer goods if weights and measures aren't adjusted and if specific highways do not become designated whole roads. Let's take a bag of sugar, one kg or two kg. That would increase by a factor of 16%, plus 16%. Sack of rice, we're all rice eaters on island, whether it be cow rose or jasmine, that would increase by a factor of 17%. A case of chicken thighs would increase by a factor of 20 of 18%. You know, I could go on citing other examples, but the point is clear. Adjusting the weights and measures of a container downward would only increase the cost of goods entering our island and ultimately driving the cost of living upwards. Therefore, Bill 83-36 as written, for me and for many of the members uh, of this committee, including our vice speaker and Senator Jim Moylan, um, it, this bill strikes the right balance. Number one, Guam's highways are protected as containers will only traverse on designated whole roads. Number two, size and weight limitations for certain vehicles traveling Guam's roads are updated and modernized. And number three, the cost of consumer goods entering our island are not negatively impacted. Senator Nelson esteem, and the esteemed senators of the 36th Guam legislature, I urge you to do the right thing for our island residents by supporting the passage of Bill 83-36. Thank you and for giving me this opportunity to provide a written testimony. Thank you, Mr. Keha. We will now call on the, forgive me, Director, Director Vince Ariola to uh, give testimony on the bill. I should have called you first, but please proceed. Not at all. Thank you very much, Senator. And thank you so much for uh, putting us ahead of our, my colleague, uh, <laughs> Ike Pareto. Really appreciate it very much. But yeah, let, let, I'll begin with my testimony. Um, Senator Nelson and members of the committee, other senators, thank you so much for uh, participating in this, in this hearing. Um, my name is Vince Ariola, and I'm the director of the Department of Public Works. I'm pleased to appear you, before you today to offer testimony in support of Bill number 8336. This bill addresses a, a number of issues related to our primary arterial roadways that are the main haul routes, where large vehicles haul goods from the Port of Guam to storage warehouses in the Harmon Industrial Park and the surrounding area. It includes modifications to the allowable size and weights of large vehicles that are allowed on Guam's main roadways. This was a co cooperative effort with the Guam Contractors Association, Chamber of Commerce, and the trucking and wholesaling industries, the department, our highway consultants, and we feel this provides a good balance of the economic needs of the industry with functional usage and future, future structural integrity of some of our main roads. The bill specifically identifies designated haul road highways, routes 1, 8, 11, and 16 that will, will allow heavier vehicle use. These roads are arterial roadways primarily used to transport goods from the Port Authority of Guam to the Harmon Industrial Park and surrounding areas, where the clear majority of wholesaler, trucking companies, freight forwarders, etc., conduct business. Due to the importance and heavy truck usage of these roads, the department supports the need for a higher design standard to ensure their continued function for mobility and economic benefits. With regard to the size and weight limitations enumerated in Bill 8336, we believe these amendments allow for improved commerce, hopefully limiting price increases in our island's economy while still maintaining safe and improved roadways. You will notice that there is a graduated increase in the overall weight limits to the year 2024. This was intentionally offered 
because a major Department of Defense funded reconstruction of Route 1 and the replacement of two Route 1 bridges along the Hall routes is slated to occur around that time. It involves strengthening and repaving the outer lanes of Route 1 from Naval Station to Route 3 and along Route 3 to Camp Blas, as well as the replacement of the Assen and Fonte Bridge. These lanes and these two bridges along Route 1 will have a load capacity significantly higher than current standards. Please note the department biannually inspects all of Guam bridges to assess their current conditions and load carrying capacity. Thank you for allowing me and the department to comment, comment on the bill. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Director Ariola. Uh, Director Pareto, are you going to give testimony on this bill? No, okay. Um, Mr. Eddie Cruz, would you like to give testimony on this bill? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute my microphone. Of course, um, I was hoping others would comment first so that way I could do the cleanup but uh, I think uh, between uh, Director Ariola and Hermikea they basically stated a large part of the problem and, and I was off island when uh, public law 33106 was in the legislature and then signed into law and as I came back I noticed a bunch of discrepancies um, to give you some background since 1980, when I returned from college as an engineer, I, uh, I, was, I had participated in many bills that controlled the weights and measures and also the laws regulating uh, commerce on Guam. So I kind of have a, a background in this. Um, what has happened in the past, our practice was um, because our island grew in population and our economy grew, is we were so used to reconstructing highways that we didn't have a strict practice of maintenance. So for the time being, up to about 1990, that was fine. Now we're getting to the point where we, we have increased highways. Uh, we, we, we need to really practice uh, maintenance. And so because maintenance wasn't an issue, we see some deterioration. And in the last decade, we've had to resurface some of the major highways and that caused a big concern of whether trucks really do damage the road. Um, since uh, public law 33-106 was signed, we've drastically done a bunch of research on the highways plus the construction practices of how we construct these highways and what the formula is of the road base and the, and the asphalt structure. Based on our studies, we found that uh, most of the newer highways were constructed well within the needs of what we transport, with the exception of a few large loads like major cranes and so, stuff like that. However, Public Law 33-106 took it a, a lot further and followed federal mandates for interstate highways, which are much more stringent. As Hermikea stated, there are haul roads in the United States that are called various different names, but they, they do lie in, in green belt areas. But the United States of America uh, on the mainland has alternate ways to move heavy cargo. And heavy cargo can be transported on waterways through barges or ships, or they can be transported on railways, which have higher standards. So that brings me back to Guam. And Guam does not have any options besides possibly floating a barge into Mariso Bay. Um, so so we, we really don't have any alternatives. And that, that brings me to the uh, reasoning to try to find a compromise that we can have and still enjoy our roadways without having to spend too much money on maintenance. So the, the specifics of this deals with having to have more axles and more tires on our heavier loads. And that compensates for the wear and the tear on the asphalt. Of course, it's a little bit higher friction, but we feel like we can afford to uh, go that extra mile because as far as going green, we will have less vehicles on the highway. And less vehicles on the highway means less of a carbon footprint, plus less traffic. We won't have to reconstruct our highways to have more lanes. 
So going back to those heavier loads, um, if you really look at the uh, regulations on shipping ocean containers and ocean freight and look at the, the difference between that and highway traffic and how we can transport those loads, there's a big disparity because one has a different standard based on Coast Guard standards and the other one has a DOT standard, which is much less. So now where do we find that common ground? Do we have a way that we can break these loads, what they call divisible loads, and transport them? Uh, because of the, the, the space of the port, we, we, we can't afford that. We don't have enough real estate there. And because in the past, the, the zoning laws on Guam, uh, there was a lot of spot zoning. So we have industrial areas, light industrial areas, and distributor areas in various parts of the island. So we need to think about that and address those because it's not fair to just say we're going to have a haul road to Harmon where there's other businesses that, that compete with them in various parts of the island, like in Maiti and Barragata and Dededo. So those were, we had to take into account. And so on this uh, haul road bill, 83-36, we listed a bunch of highways to start out with. And let's, let me just uh, mention that that is a start to developing the haul highways because haul highways, uh, based on this bill that we propose, there may be other highways that can be added. And I'll give you an ex example. Route 3 is undergoing reconstruction right now. The small portion of Route 9 between Anderson Air Force Base, which is where Route 1 connects to, and the Camp Blas area needs to be reconstructed. Once that's reconstructed, and there's been a study done to make sure that those hallways, that, I mean, that highway can handle the heavier loads, we've given some flexibility to the Director of the Department of Public Works to designate that as a hallway, whole highway. There are other roadways that we can also do that on. One is Route 15, which is already being used as a haul road. However, it's not designated because it has a standard that, that was kind of like a Band-Aid fix. It was repaved just to take care of those uh, trucks that go up and down uh, without causing damage to it. But that highway eventually will have to be reconstructed so we can accommodate the heavy construction loads coming from the businesses on the back road like Hawaiian Rock and Smith Bridge and, and so forth. But... We, we did did a thorough study, and we did do a thorough study on the South. I know Senator Peter Turtlahi has been uh, very vocal about the roads in the South. And I can sympathize with him because I drive that frequently, and I see uh, what has happened. And I, I kind of think that we need to relook at how uh, the transportation of solid waste goes to Lazon down that highway, uh, affects that highway, and what we can do to mitigate that because it technically it is uh, substandard for those loads. But without driving consumer costs up, I think we need to start with something the government of Guam has control of. And that is proposing these whole road highways and in implementing the law so we can keep the costs down. So uh, just based on that, I am in favor of Bill 83-36 because it addresses all the problems. It addresses the engineering problems where we need to uh, preserve our highways and also do it in a manner that's safe, like having extra axles on trailers, um, having additional lengths if we have overload uh, loads and uh, so forth. But, uh, you know, I had been lots of discussion with Director Ariola, and he asked me many questions. And so my questions are based on science and, and, and engineering. And, and so I basically gave them the answers that, yes, we can live with these weight limits. And as we adjust the highways and strengthen them, strengthen the bridges, um, we can live with that. I think it's a it's a win-win formula. And if you take the gamble of which do you do, do you restrict the loads uh, like uh, Public Law 33106? Uh, proposed, or do we find a compromise that we can adjust? And uh, this compromise far outweighs keeping the costs uh, of living on Guam down. So 
Um, you know, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to call me or uh, email me, and I will be glad to sit down with any of the senators that have further questions. But I think that it uh, this is a start, and it per does protect the Southern Highways because uh, Public Law 33-106 will still be in effect, and it will still restrict the loads to try to protect those uh, roadways without having any effect on it. So, in effect, this uh, Bill 83-36 only affects haul roads. So I just want to get that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. I do not. Um, I do not see anyone else testifying for this bill, Bill Number eighty three dash thirty six. Okay, so then we will move on to the uh, to Vice Speaker Barnes, and for her questions or comments, Vice Speaker. Thank you, Thank you uh, so very much, uh, Majority Leader, Madam Chair. Uh, for for again this hearing again and allowing the um, testimonies in. If I can note for the record, um, uh, the the testimony from Mr. Cruz or and Mr. Kea, if they're written, uh, if they can submit it to the um, to the committee, please. Uh, just for record purposes, I know there was a request on the chat, but more importantly, um, there's also one from Guam Chamber, uh, Madam. Uh, Chair, if you if they could be submitted also to the send the Google uh, Drive by speaker. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I don't have any questions. I, I uh, with the exception maybe if Mr. Ariola is still here. Um, I know that Mr. Cruz spoke about the possibility of Route 15, Route 9, and Route 3, and uh, maybe I'd like to ask him what are his personal thoughts on the consideration and authorizing of him to for those routes to be added as halls um, in the near future, especially knowing that the um, that resources will be coming in to hearten these roads. So if Mr. Ariola could, could share his thoughts. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Vice Speaker. I guess as, as um, most of you already know, we do have the uh, our federal highway program that, that we implement here at Department of Public Works. And we do, we do have the Guam Transportation Improvement, Improvement Plan also, uh, GTIP. And so um, we don't have 15 uh, uh, scheduled for anything in the next two years, Route 15 in the next two years. But what, uh, what basically takes place is, is we do uh, road and highway assessments uh, and, and their future use as well. So based on that, uh, the assessments that we do, the, we assess the, the condition, we assess the future use, we do traffic counts, uh, we do a number of, of reviews and assessments to see, uh, uh, and of course, consider road degradation uh, to basically determine what roads go on, on the GTIP. And, and uh, of course, a lot of it is dependent on available funding. Um, so we are constantly looking at all the all the the major routes uh, throughout the island to include Route 15, uh, Route 10, uh, Route 4, and uh, you know based on the availability of of, of funding, uh, we we basically go out there and and we attack them, uh, and, and we get them on online for either restrengthening. Uh, some uh, some of the the projects we have are also just a uh, a rather um, uh, um, heavy duty patchwork that we do, uh, which we did along Route 8 about two years ago. Uh, that, that seemed to be very, very um, uh, advantageous for us as opposed to paving the entire road. We just, we basically did a lot of cutouts and re-strengthened the, 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 the weak areas of, of the, the Route 8 there. And so we're, we're looking to do that uh, actually this year to a, to a number of highways as soon as we can get this, uh, our, our, this contract signed. Uh, and it's all federally funded, but you're correct. We are looking, we're, we're hopeful that we'll, we'll get additional federal funding from uh, FHWA this year as, as part of all our COVID issues. Thank you, uh, Director Ariel and Sijus Masi. Again, Madam Chair, for giving me the opportunity to present this bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Speaker. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, the minority leader, Senator Chris Duenas. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Um, I'll, I'll now call on Senator Moylan if you have any questions or comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, no questions. Just want to say thank you for the uh, hard work uh, Mr. Cruz has put in and Hermie and, and several others and and how we were able to bring this bill uh, forward from the 35th to the 36th. And I thank the sponsor uh, for the introduction. I think we came up with a great compromise and especially with the support of uh, the director there, Mr. Ariola, uh, in conjunction with the uh, governor's office, uh, working together for our small businesses and also helping our consumers at the same time. So thank you very much uh, for introducing the bill and, and moving this forward. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Mm -hmm. Senator Mary Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the testimony today. Uh, it, it's actually quite useful in, in recognizing the balance that was struck with um, the previous bill introduced in, in this Bill 83. Um, the Hall Roads is certainly a welcome addition to it, uh, including the investment that the federal government has committed to put in. But I, I wanted to ask, what do you expect would be the conversion of um, like uh, of containers that are, are at present weight limits right now to overweight containers should this bill pass? Would the vast majority of containers being shipped to Guam um, likely be overweight containers as a result of 83? No? Okay, Mr. Cruz is shaking his head. All right. Um, so that's a good thing. The, the other question that I had is, were there any considerations given or are there considerations that you're aware of in other jurisdictions that utilize haul roads? Um, are there considerations given to the limits on, on the, the allowable times to traverse these roadways? Can, can uh, I answer that real quick? Yes, please. Okay, so there, there, are, uh, there are laws and regulations in the books right now. Public Works does have regulations as far as travel times of overloaded weights, but it's based on, uh, a lot of it is based on what the hazard is. So if it's only a few thousand pounds over, which uh, that's why we're adjusting these weights on the haul roads, it's not a big amount. Only about 20% of them will probably uh, exceed the, the limits. And most of these limits don't have anything to do with uh, really the, the, the weight on, on and the damage on the road, so to speak. It has to do with what they call the bridge formula, which a bridge formula is a, is a scientific calculation based on how much impact a vehicle has on a certain structure. We don't have big long bridges, so there's no concern uh, for damage to big long bridges, but we do have smaller bridges and we still wanna protect those. So that's why in the South where we have substandard bridges and we have smaller bridges that haven't been maintained, we want to keep those uh, within the, 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 the regulation standards of Bill 33 or law, Public Law 33-106, but there already are uh, procedures in place for obtaining permits in, in the event that th these bigger loads have to go down those roads. And proposed fines have been ad addressed and we've discussed them. And those fines will have to go through a different process, of course, for the legislature to get passed but they will address any damage that those heavier loads will do on highways that are not haul roads. So uh, I think to, to answer your question, yes, uh, DPW is very aware of that. DPW has a flexibility to control those. DPW has the, uh, the authority to require escorts and various monitoring and hardening of certain areas in the event they have to go through a different route or have to cross over, uh, you know, to get on back on the hall road. So we've, we've already uh, looked at all those. And to answer your question, yes, there, there are things in place and there are other states that have similar procedures that we have observed, studied, and tried to find a solution for Guam, which is basically the same thing. We, we, we follow those procedures. The, the only procedure we don't follow is most states have a website 
and a, and a way that they get permitting and get approved and get the permit, Guam doesn't have that yet. But so far, uh, DPW is very good about uh, getting us permits in a, in a short time. So I have to thank them for that. And it hasn't uh, impeded any commerce for those type of loads. But yes, there is a concern for those heavier loads, but we've addressed it. And if you look at the, the facts of, of uh, public law or, or bill 83-36, which has the weights on there, has the restrictions, but because it doesn't, uh, the haul roads don't cross over too many bridges. And most of those bridges are either hardened or will be up for hardening pretty quickly. Um, those weight limitations, as far as the bridge formula, will not affect that. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that explanation. My point is simply from the point, and I understand the hazards, and we have noticed when there are movements of poles or heavy equipment, uh, or even the movement of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, war equipment, bombs and things like that. They, we know that those are, are often done, you know, under very certain stringent circumstances and, and guidance. Um, but I'm referring specifically to the hazard to persons in these, these routes now that are essentially the, the major routes on Guam that are heavily traversed by the general population of Guam. And then that's my concern. You've got, you've got mopeds and small vehicles these little mini Japanese cars now on the road, bicyclists using the shoulder of the road. And, and so my concern is, you know, in, in some foreign jurisdictions that I've visited, a lot of that heavy traversing of overweight equipment or certain types of industrial uh, equipment tends to move only at certain hours. And usually it's, it's between, you know, um, uh, in, in the wee hours of, of the night or morning where the general public is not using the same roadways. And that's what I was talking about. I know it doesn't make for good commerce, but I believe that on Guam's roads, being that, that many of our roads are unlike, they're constructed like major highways, but they're used as, as uh, you know, secondary roads in some ways in, in that people come in and out of them. Um, there's a lot of stop and go. There's a lot of, you know, left turns in. Um, and that's that's the general safety that I was referring to in terms of limiting the movement of these types of overweight vehicles, because it is quite daunting. Uh, uh, Mr. Cruz, it is quite daunting to to drive by and have those things barreling by you. Um, Senator, can, can I answer that really quickly? Um, yeah. As far as those movements, if, if prior to to public law 33-106, it was basically wide open. There was no regulation of these weights. These weights that we're, we're proposing now, uh, these overloads, they have been traveling down the highways for decades. Uh, the bigger loads, which you are concerned with, like transformers and power plants and stuff, I had done many of those moves. You're absolutely correct. We did them in the wee hours of the morning. We did it under escorts. We did it with police uh, blocking the intersections so that's that's all in the flexibility of the department of public works they have the ability to restrict us on those kind of loads the other loads we're talking about are just the ones that are in normal container loads basically and they have been traveling up and down the highways for decades it's just trying to adjust these weights so we can allow them to legally do it but do it with better equipment so that way it doesn't damage the road now, I wanted to make a note that these haul roads that the military was proposing and DPW through discussion, I wasn't part of the discussion, but they wanted to use the outermost lane on the highways. Well, that's fine and dandy on a, on a highway that has basically uh, two lanes in each direction, a turn lane in the center. But when you're talking about areas that have curbs and sidewalks and, and power poles very close to the edge of the roadway, I, I brought up the opposition to that and I asked Vince, I said, can you please relook at that? Because that poses a hazard, like exactly what you said. If you've got a bicycle dodging in and out of a driveway to go around an obstacle, like these GTA uh, boxes and, and signs to try to go around them, that is a hazard. 
And if you have a big heavy truck going down that outside lane, you know, Lord knows what could happen. So I've asked him, I said, if there's a three lane highway going either direction, can we use that center lane? Mm -hmm. Additionally, if you look at the, the design of our utilities, a lot of the, the manholes go on the outside lane. Now, because there's no real standard that was followed, they're, they're all over the roadways, but even the culvert boxes for the drainage are in the right-hand outside lane next to the curb. If you drive in the rain, you'll see that it's flooded. What happens to a, a vehicle that hits that water? It wants to go towards the curb. So that is a hazard. And being a, having a loaded truck, that also poses a hazard. Here. So I've asked Director Ariola to go back and look at that and reconsider whether it's better to have it on all the way in the outside, which truckers call the suicide lane, because they're constantly slamming on the brakes for cars entering and, and crossing the roadway, and also trying to dodge uh, bicyclists and, and maybe pedestrians. So being in that center of the three lanes going each direction, I think that's a better deal. If it were up in Dededo or towards Jigo where there's a shoulder, then absolutely restrict them to the outside lane there. That's perfect. But, you know, we, we have to be creative on this. Guam is, is pretty unique. Our highways are a little bit different from what they have in the States. You're absolutely correct. In California, most of your residential areas have a, have a solid wall between that and a major highway that trucks use. Guam doesn't have that regulation. I, I, I asked in 1983, I said, can you guys come up with a new zoning regulation where new subdivisions, they build a, a solid concrete or, or some kind of solid wall between the highway and the residential subdivisions so children don't chase their ball out on the highway? And because of funding, they told me, no, we couldn't afford that. Same with bike lanes. We would like to have a, see a bike lane on, on every major highway where there's a curb and sidewalk. And that way they would have a safe place to travel. But of course, we only have so much real estate. We only have so much of an easement. So we have to share it with utilities, power poles, signage, and, and so forth. So we kind of have to think out of the box here and say, you know, how safe can we go and what can we afford? And that's why I asked uh, Director Ariola, can you relook at those and look in the areas like Tamuni and Dededo where they have curbs and there's three lanes going either direction. Can we move that part in lane to the center of those three lanes? I think that's a, a, a safe compromise. But going back to your question, Senator Torres, you're absolutely correct. Safety is the utmost uh, concern and we need to have people monitoring that. And in the original proposal to the changes of Public Law 33106, we even tried to add other law enforcement agencies and other agencies uh, that can question whether these loads are overweight or whether they're safe or what. But of course, we need to tackle one issue at a time. And that's why we, we scaled everything down and we said, okay, let's just ask for uh, haul roads first. And then we'll look at other concerns and address those as they come up and as we have funding. So, you know, we could we could have changed the world in one bill or we could have uh, done it another way. And, and we've chosen to try to uh, prevent the impedance of commerce first. And then we'll work our way and we'll look at these other things because there there are other concerns. And the majority of them are not really highway usage concerns. They're design concerns. They're designs between the contractor and Department of Public Works, uh, between the engineers and, and the military. And, you know, other people that use the road. There's, there's so many people that use the roads for different reasons. Uh, I see those little vehicles that you're concerned with. My big concern is, that, do they meet DOT standards? Are they safe in a rollover? Are they safe in a, in a crash? Um, yeah. You know, pre previously, we, we, did, we didn't allow those. They were, those are JDM vehicles designed for the Asian market. And because of our, our strict uh, national highway and DOT standards, we didn't allow them. Now, I don't know what has uh, progressed through the years where now they're allowing those, they're allowing right-hand drives and everything else, um, you know, but that's, that's none of my business. It's out of my uh, job description yeah. right now. So okay. those are things I'm glad you're bringing them up because those are important.
But we need to address uh, immediately something that GovGuam has a control of, and that's these haul roads that we can keep the consumer costs down. Uh, Herbie talked about Tan Maria and Tun Jose. You know, if they're on a fixed income from retirement from government of Guam or they're getting Medicare uh, or whatever it is they get, Social Security, the impact of this uh, law 33-106 is going to hurt them. They're, they're going to have to choose between having dinner or paying for utilities or paying for a, a gas to go to a doctor's visit. And that's what concerns me. Yeah, well, so. thank you, Mr. Cruz. I, I was just thinking really about public safety, and I, I know that um, that those are also issues that will come up when they design those hall roads, which is uh, a good thing. But uh, thank You're you. You're correct, Mom. and I, I, I hope they do a task force uh, to to do that, to, to study that, and not wait till the actual construction comes in, and then we see the problems. So we need to, we need to, I'm glad you, you senators are looking at that, because those are things that you need to question uh, as these projects come up. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Senator Torres. Senator Pito, do you have any questions or comments at this time? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I just want to just mention that, you know, Public Law 33106 was passed. Uh, during my time when I was chair for DPW. And I want to thank Eddie Cruz and, and Hermie for, for their input with, uh, you know, with their testimony. And, you know, the um, uh, bill uh, 8336 is another uh, good thing that came about. And I want to, I want to thank the, uh, the vice speaker for introducing bill uh, 33, um, 83-36 because this, 8336 invigorated, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, public law 33136. And I want to thank the uh, vice speaker and uh, Senator Moynan for introducing this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Pito. Senator Brown, do you have any questions at this time? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I actually do. And I just wanted to check with the director of DPW. I mean, really, if where this all uh, started with regards to mandating, um, you know, restrictions with regards to the weights of these containers and these trucks on the road had to do uh, with federal highway and the funds that they provide annually to the government of Guam and to the people of Guam uh, in constructing our main roads. All our main roads on Guam pretty much are funded by the federal government in the millions of dollars. Um, and certainly that's one of the reasons also why the, um, the facility down there at the port was constructed to do the weights on these uh, containers as they left the port of Guam. So I wanted to ask, have that question answered. I mean, the director did mention he, he you know, been consulting with his engineers there. Uh, but what is the position of Federal Highway with regards to these increased weights? Because we're already seeing, and certainly since my time there at DPW, um, we're already seeing some of the newer roadways, including the tri-intersection at Route 8. Uh, I see it also fairly regularly looking at Route 8, I mean, Route 4 and Route 10 uh, with Mingilo, Chalampago. Some of these intersections that have since been rebuilt or resurfaced, and I certainly know the thickness and a lot of the time and effort that was put into constructing the tri-intersection to accommodate these additional weights. But we already see the ridging of these roadways within a matter of, what, less than seven, eight years? Um, so I wanted some feedback with regards to what is Federal Highway's position, because they're the ones that, that essentially require that the waste station be constructed and that the weights be of these containers be checked. And, and that's the primary concern. And I think almost any resident that drives on our roadways are going to tell you the quality of our roads. Um, you know, even though while we continue to see upgrades and improvements and bridges that are being built, uh, I was there with the reconstruction of the Aganya Bridge, the Talafofo Bridge, the Yelig Bridge. I mean, I mean, just Yelig itself was over $11 million to rebuild that, that particular bridge and took goodness several years in the whole process before everything was finally completed. Uh, so I do want to know from DPW is what is the uh, position of Federal Highway with regards to these increased loads? Because that's the reason those restrictions uh, were proposed. I mean, that came from Federal Highway. And is that going to affect our, our funding that we receive for road construction? Because that's all paid for by the federal taxpayer. 
If Vince is not available, can I answer that question? Because I was in the conversation. Well, I actually would like Vince to answer that question since he's the official government representative for DPW. What is the official position of Federal Highway? Is he still on, Madam Chair? Director Ariola, are you still there? He had to atten- attend a funeral, so I, I think he's he's left the Zoom meeting. Well, if not, certainly, Mr. Cruz, if you want to respond, I think we probably should still after follow up with uh, DPW with Federal Highway, because as, as I mentioned, you know, in my experience, that was the main reason why these restrictions were put in place. The federal government didn't want to continue to provide funding, um, you know, if we were not going to regulate the weights on the roadways. You know, Senator Brown, I appreciate your concern of that. We studied that thing and we communicated with uh, our Congress uh, man and our Congresswoman at the time, uh, Madeline Berdeo. And what happened, and we do have a letter that was given to DPW and given to the Lieutenant Governor, the Governor and the Legal Counsel that says absolutely that there is no truth to that, what you're saying about highway funds, uh, you know, and that was, that was brought on by uh, FHWA uh, representatives that if we didn't control the weights, that they would take the funding back, that we'd have to repay it. But we have a, sec- a, a letter from the Secretary of Transportation that says that absolutely not. And we have documents on the committee uh, from Congress that actually state that, that because we're a territory, there's certain things that are a little different. And, and those were exceptions that were put into the, the law from Congress that allocated the funds. So uh, to answer your question, no, there's no truth to that. And as far as addressing what you're talking about, uh, we did studies on all the highways. A lot of those highways that you're talking about are not eight and seven and eight years old. They're way over 10 years. The expected life of the friction surface at the top is only 10 years. And Mr. Accord- Mr. I, I according to, you? yes, please. Um, I believe that we have Mr. Lyndon Kobayashi who could answer oh, on behalf good. of the director. Okay. I, I didn't recognize that he was here. Um, so if, if I may defer the answer since it was asked of, uh, sure. of DPW and they can answer in their official capacity. All right, thank you, Mr. Cruz. And I apologize for the interruption. Thank, thank, thank you, senators. Can you guys hear me? I just wanna check first. Okay. So um, to, to Senator Brown's question on was Federal Highway um, consulted and the impacts on funding. Um, so so the, the, the upcoming project that Vince referred to what, where we would be restrengthening the outside lanes, um, that's a DOD funded project where um, DPW just, re- just received funds to, um, to design it. Um, Federal Highways is okay with um, upgrading the standards to, sh- to a higher design standards granted DPW um, has a plan to to implement, enforce, and so forth, um, and and the funding is 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 acceptable by Federal Highways um, as far as trying to um, allowing them to design to a higher standard, and it, it shouldn't jeopardize any other funds. I mean, I understand the design to a higher standard because I'm sure for DOD as well. I mean, they're going to be things over these roadways that they're paying for. I'm sure they're going to want a higher standard. That doesn't answer my question. And contrary to Mr. Cruz. Um, you know, I did service DPW for two years. I did interact on a fairly regular basis with Federal Highway. Uh, perhaps at the higher level, they had a different position. But with regards to the federal officials that we did deal with from Hawaii, uh, that's one of the main reasons that the, the way station was constructed. And I was also there when that project was put in place and constructed, as well as the uh, rebuilding of Route 11 that went to the Authority of Guam, again, funded by the federal government. So while uh, I appreciate Mr. Cruz's input from his perspective, if he does have these letters, that's wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, the information that was provided for us at the time that the waste scale, because otherwise, why bother constructing a waste scale station? What would be the logic in putting that in place if we weren't concerned about any of the weights on the roadway? Uh, or, the, or the perspective that additional weights of a certain load are not going to adversely affect the quality of our roads. And I bring this up because I I have no issue if they have no issue and it's not going to affect the federal funding. But I think we're seeing over time the deterioration of our main roads. We're seeing also, for example, which we run into, I do every day, 
uh, with regards to the sewer manholes, for example, when the roads were originally constructed, they were all smooth and flush, but we see as time goes on with the weight and, and you know, eventual traffic going on back and forth over these roadways. Uh, you're seeing the sinking of that asphalt. You're seeing some of these uh, manholes that were constructed, you know, with a, a border of concrete now are, are actually road hazards uh, because uh, the asphalt surrounding it continue to deteriorate. So that does not address ultimately the issue of the deterioration of the roadways and what work or funding is going to be addressed to address that. I mean, let's look at the main roads, uh, Route 1. Let's look at Route 10. Let's look at, oh my goodness, let's look at Hospital Road. I mean, the list goes on here on Guam of roadways that are damaged. And then who's going to regulate it? Let me ask that question. Who's going to be regulating where these trucks are going? Is DPW going to be out on the road doing this? Is DPW going to know what load or weights are, are going on there? How's DPW currently with Revan Tax uh, addressing the uh, weights of containers coming out of the port now? Uh, so what are your answers to those questions? Because those questions are questions I know many of our people have just simply because they continue to just see, even with our newer roadways, just the deterioration uh, and the lack of our ability in what they see as a timely fashion to address, uh, you know, rebuilding and resurfacing these roadways. Excuse me, may I interject, Senator Brown? Um, Mr. Kobayashi um, would like to comment. Uh, thank you. So Senator Brown, those are those are um, really good concerns. Um, so I guess to answer your first question on why is a why was the test facility built? So the test facility was built to help to help enforce and to help preserve the roads. Um, so what's being proposed with this law is a truck corridor that uh, along Route One, which um, which is funded for construction. You asked about funding earlier. Um, as far as deterioration and assessment of you know the deteriorating roads, so DPW is required every two years to inspect all the bridges um, on Guam. And every two to four years that we've been doing a pavement analysis, a pavement assessment for the condition of all the roads. And that's kind of what feeds into DPW's um, capital improvement plan for um, future projects. So as a result of that, um, DPW has an ongoing IDIQ construction contract, which allows um, as needed paving contracts to um, be issued to a, a contractor via task order. And that's fed into based on the pavement assessments where deterioration is, um, is assessed. Um, as far as impact to Route 10, um, DPW has a project that's programmed for construction to do pavement repairs to Route 10, um, as well as for Route 14. Um, as far as regulating um, and enforcing it, um, DPW does have a plan to, um, to issue out, um, to purchase mobile scales to be able to check you know, areas outside the truck corridor to ensure that they're complying with the current law. So um, th 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 those, are, those are in process. Is, is the way scale station still consistently active in, in checking loads coming out now out of the port on a regular basis? Is it an operation? Does it continue so the, to stay in operation? Sorry. Yeah, the, the, the test scales has been down since summer. So DPW is in the process of trying to get it recalibrated and updated to um, get it back. Since up summer of what year? This year? Last year? We're just summer starting. Summer of, I think, summer of last year. So the DPW is so trying the, to get. The way scales at the port have been down for one year? Correct. So there's no activity going on with regards to measuring or weighing any of the loads coming out of the port? As of, as of summer, no. And how long is it going to take? It's been a year. That's a long time to be inoperable. Yeah. So, so right, I know right now that it's currently being, it's currently being repaired right now as we speak. And do you have any, I, I'm just noticing around there, are there any current activities in construction right now? I've not seen any lately in the last couple of years. Am I missing anything? Uh, are there any new roadways that are being worked on in the last couple of years, even now currently? Is there any new work, DPW projects? on the main roads, federally yes. funded? So Route 3, uh, we, we just finished um, widening Route 3 uh, out there by Camp Laws. That was the largest project DPW has ever put, not put out. Um, right now we and have- that's been ongoing. That project's been ongoing for the last 10 years, Route 3, yes. Anything else around the island besides Route 3? Yes. So right now we, we, we just, um, we're in the process of awarding the uh, Route 28 East Sing Song paving project. So that one okay. should be hopefully by summer and then Route 1 resurfacing from Route 30, which is um, Carlos Camacho Road to Airport Road, looking at trying to do resurfacing along there shortly. Okay. Well, I, I look forward to those projects. Again, I, I still don't have a real sense of clarification 
uh, with regards to, because the actual, I was not here in the 33rd Guam legislature when that legislation was passed, but I know the key issue as to how the weights were determined, that was a concern, was the impact of the weights of these containers uh, and the trucks would have on the roadway and concerns about deterioration. I mean, obviously a lot of federal money has been invested into the construction of the roadways. We wanna ensure that those are maintained. Um, these, you know, there's this issue of this hall and I think it's great they're identifying these, these new hall roads, but these roads were not originally designed for that. And, and at DPW, who is doing your, who is the engineer doing the inspections on these bridges? So we, we have a um, IDIQ contract that's we're in the process of every, every two years per stewardship with um, Governor Guam Federal Highways, we're required to do this. So right now it's, uh, we're, we're, we're working on the contract to be able to issue that to a, 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 a consultant, a private consultant. Who, curr who, currently does the, um, who currently does the assessment? Is it um, an engineer that you guys hire from a private contract to do it? Yes. Who does it? So the but you do, do you, was, do you, Sorry, is it done by is it done by your consultants for Federal Highway, or you have a separate contract outside of that specifically for DPW to do the um, the assessments? There's a separate consultant um, that that DPW hires to do those assessments, the bridge inspections. And do you have any in-house engineer from DPW currently in staff? Um, right now, um, the, the 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 consultant to DPW does have capabilities to do it, but uh, we've been we, we, in order to ensure quality work, we've been alternating between um, consultant and getting independent looks at it just to ensure that, um, you know, it's, it's being looked at by se separate folks. I, I appreciate your, your answer. Again, I just, I just think, Madam Chair, that one question really does need to be answered with regards to what weight limit has been determined by Federal Highway. I mean, if they're able to distribute these loads, I think it would be good to see an official or current response uh, to ensure that it doesn't affect the ability of our program and certainly our people to be able to receive uh, federal funding. I appreciate Mr. Cruz's input, but again, I mean, I have my own firsthand experience and firsthand knowledge in working with Federal Highway if their policy has since changed. Uh, it certainly would be good to see in writing what their official position is with regards to the funding that they provide and the maintenance of the highway, which under that agreement is the responsibility of the government of Guam. Uh, once these roads are built. But I think our people see quite often that while we build the roads, we almost do little to maintain them, uh, be it markings on the road, signs on the road, uh, repairs and filling of, of damage to the roadway potholes. I mean, the list goes on. I mean, if there's probably one of the key things our people probably will relay a tremendous dissatisfaction is our inability to continue to pave and maintain the roadways. But with that, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to inquire and provide uh, questions with regards to this bill. Thank you, Senator, Senator Brown. Um, Mr. Kobayashi, if you could please submit to the committee the clarification on the question that Senator Brown had had on the weight limits required by federal highways. Yes, we, we, we will do so. Thank you. Okay, Senator Tidegui, do you have any questions or comments? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too had a question with regards to federal highways and I thank Senator Brown for asking that question. In fact, uh, you know, being a, a former director of there, a lot of the questions I had to was answering. But what was what I found kind of disturbing was the fact that the wait station has been down for for quite some time. You know, to monitor our um, those uh, trucks that are going onto the road right now. Um, I did have a question with regards, and this would probably be for DPW, or I don't know if you're able to answer this question, but it's regarding the uh, rules and regulations on on uh, what type of uh, uh, what type of administrative rules and regulations um, that you plan on considering for Bill uh, 83 if adopted. Mr. Yeah, okay. Sorry, so, um, so the rules and regulations for this um, proposed Bill 8336, they're, 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 they're in process um, right now. Um, I think I think that's all I can say. That it's been it's been I know that it's being worked on and it's in process. Okay, do you, can you give me a little bit some what are some of the types that are rules and regs that are going to be involved? So I so for the uh, I, I know that um, some of the older some of the older fees um, from from the, the previous the previous uh, law were um, old and outdated. So we've been working with the industry to to update those. Um, 
as well as some of the permit fees potentially. So I know that those are um, um, the reason, I think one of the reasons why um, why we wanted to separate those rules and regs from this bill was to uh, allow um, um, allow change over time because um, like with the, the previous bill, before bill 8336, um, you know, the, the wage law had been in place for, you know, something like 50 years, right? So um, th th those fees were, were very outdated. So I think by having it as a separate rules and regulation, it, it would allow DPW to be able to be able to um, adjust those based on you know the, the, the current the current needs okay. but i'm not fully involved on, on that that's in process eddie i don't know if you you want to talk a bit more about 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 the the fees and the the permit permit amounts that's been worked on yeah, separately. if i could we worked with the both administrations uh governor calvo's administration and and currently governor leon guerrero's administration and those those uh, fees and penalties have to be uh, done separately, I think, because of the way that the legislature wants to be a part of that. So it has to have approval of the legislature, from what I understand. Now, of course, they were old. They were they were uh, the fees were established during uh, the committee that I served on with uh, Juan Limpiaco, formerly of uh, Pacific Trucking, and. What it is, is uh, we came up with an updated one as per both uh, Director Leon Guerrero with the previous administration's request and also of uh, Director Ariola. And we thought that, if anything, the penalties should be stricter than the permit fees or, uh, you know, the, the, the fees required to transport overloaded trailers by special permit. So... Being that what it is, that's probably going to be a separate bill that's going to come up before you senators, and you can address that. But I think uh, the whole idea, and I, I see the concern that Senator Brown had for the weight station, but you got to remember, that's not the only way to regulate the weights. We have weights of the containers as they come into the port. We have weights of trucks as they come out of the scales at various areas. So those alone, we can use those. That's not, you know, the test facility is not the only solution to monitor these trucks and they've been very proactive at it and also pieces of equipment that transported on low boys those all have scale weights uh, of the vehicles so we have other ways to determine whether they're overloaded or what and the director has the flexibility to make a determination if he deems that a load is overloaded and and can be questioned because the law as it's written now allows them to take that uh, container or, or load that they suspect is overweight and can take it to a scale somewhere, whether it be at Hawaiian Rock, Smith Bridge, or any other place that they have a commercial scale that's used for commerce and weigh it. And that's what they've been doing. So I think there, there still is some protection in there. I, I don't think there's a big concern that uh, perhaps we're allowing these damaging Loads go up and down the road, but I think the user fee for the permits uh, have to be adjusted, and it's also based on what WSP Parsons uh, determined was the damage to the roadways by overweight trucks. So we have we have a finite number on that already, and that's given us an idea of how to adjust those fees and penalties. But I think the penalties uh, enough are, are going to deter truckers from uh, traveling overweight loads without a permit if i could answer that okay well, yes well thank you mr kobayashi uh for, for answering some of that question and of course finishing it off um at a greatly appreciated um i you and i have spoken before and and talked about axles and things but you know on page 23 of the bill and also page 25 it mentions rules and regulations you know so it mentions it twice and that and that's a and and why I brought it up because you have it first in uh, chapter five of title 16. And then again, on 20 uh, page 23, you have it again to promulgate rules and regulations in this section. So it, it's there twice. So that's the question I was asking. If you are, you are asking about putting a separate legislation to promulgate rules and regs and fees and fines. Um, I'm not sure if it could all be, 
combine together because on page 23, it, it definitely has costs associated with that. So I'm, we'll look at it further, I'm sure. And I, I wanted to um, also bring up something as you said earlier that to ease my mind, because it's kind of uh, scary to know that these trucks are, are going on the road that are not even being weighed. But you're saying right now over uh, the Port Authority, they're weighing these trucks already at the port? Is that what you're saying, Ed? Oh, okay. What I'm saying is, and, and it's another way of, of figuring this out. We did this many years with motor carrier. Motor carrier has weights on the registration of the vehicle, has a weight on the trailer, has a weight on the truck. So you take that weight and you combine it with the weight of the actual bill of lading number for that container, and that gives you a gross vehicle weight. Gives you an idea within so many thousand pounds whether it's overweight or not. And basically, it's, it's basically like doing a calculation on a bridge formula. You have these numbers, you put them together, you plug them in, and it gives you, uh, uh, maybe not exact to the pound, but it gives you an idea of whether they're overweight or not. Now, if that's what you're talking about, that's what Motor Carrier has been doing for years. In fact, they had a program back in the early 2000s where they wanted truckers to put the weight of the vehicle itself on the vehicle, on the side of the vehicle, like they do in some states. And then when they pull you over or they inspect you or you go through a checkpoint, they take your manifest, which you're required to have. You have to have a document that says what you're hauling, how much it weighs, where did it come from, where is it going? And they use that and they add it to the weight of the vehicle. And that's how they figure it out in the old days, whether you're overweight or not. And that was a, a really good process because we didn't have a test facility. Okay. Now we have a okay. test facility. I think the, the, the problem that Joe, Senator Brown is talking about is we need to make sure it's funded to be maintained. And, uh, you know, because of where the tropics, uh, electronics okay. like that has problems. So I, I don't, you know, I don't think it's anybody's fault. So my, so again, my question was if they're doing it currently right now and your, and your, your response to that was explaining how things are done. So I just wanted to make sure that your answer is yes, they are currently doing yes. it now. Absolutely. Okay. And maybe, you know, you talked about how to put it on, on the vehicle itself, um, the weight uh, of that truck. I mean, that might be part of the rules and regs uh, to incorporate because that seems easy enough, especially those who are enforcing uh, the law that they could uh, look at both to see if it's it well, concurs. Senator, I, I, uh, I, I propose that. And what the problem was, was it's already written on the registration. So it's kind of a redundant thing. Uh, I, I, you know, offered to, to have that because it gives visibility where if motor carrier sees a truck going by automatically, they know that's a truck and they can look at the load and they say, well, he normally carries 12 ton. So it looks like it's more than 12 ton. Now it gives you the idea to question it. Right. So mm -hmm. that was my proposal, but you know, you got to remember that we've got limited personnel. We've got limited capacity to do these. And, and that's why we built the test station because uh, that way we can control the, the, the loads coming out of the port. Now, it does only controls it one way. you got to remember that. It controls it only coming out of the port. There is no scale procedure going into the port. So when you're exporting uh, recycled materials or, or maybe uh, aggregate that's going to another island project, those aren't necessarily inspected because it's they're going the opposite direction. But... There are other ways to do it. And we were proposing that within the next 25 years, we want to have at least two to three more weight stations along the way on the major routes, basically on the haul routes. So that way they could control 85 to 90% of the traffic, uh, commercial truck traffic. Uh, and then going to other places, they could always be rerouted down to the main haul roads to get inspected. So I think there, there's safeguards in place. And we've had a lot of good discussion, a lot of good ideas. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with personnel and, and operational costs. But, uh, you know, we can always dream that direction and hope to go that direction because I think we're all on the same page. We're all together looking of how we can preserve our roadways. And I think part of it, too, is like uh, Lyndon, I was hoping you'd speak of it because he has a big part to play on that. And it's maintenance. Maintenance of the asphalt. You, you resurface it every 10 years is what they recommend. And we haven't been doing that. So, you know, that's part of the 
program we need to look at. Maybe you senators can look at it and fund it or request that they come up with a, a procedure where they analyze it every so many years and then go back and, and request for funding from either the feds or with go go on. You know, that's our, we can use our highway funds for that. I greatly appreciate all the work you've put into this, um, Ed. And I think there's something that you said that's very important before any of this legislation is considered is the personnel and the operational cost in order to move this legislation through. You know, we can't just push it through and then expect, you know, cross our fingers that there's some funding. I think the most important thing here is safety, safety of our people on the streets. That's first and foremost. Uh, and, and I think if, if we're going to move forward with this legislation, the rules and regs might be able to uh, address some of the shortfalls or the outdated um, funding or fines that were placed in 19 Forgotten incorporate that. But we're talking about if this bill passes and, and it starts right away, it needs the funding. It needs the funding. And you're right, you mentioned that, and I just hope moving forward that any time we, any of us introduce legislation that you have the funding to back it up. But I thank you so much for all your work and appreciate the time you spent with me personally to explain, especially about the axles. And I noticed there's a lot of information on in this legislation uh, addressing the axles and how the importance on the distribution of weight in the trucks itself. Thank you that's, so that's, much. That's, thank that's, you. that's a big, big factor in safety also, Senator, and I appreciate it talking to you and I hope that you know I have an open door if any of you want to speak to me um, I'd be willing to meet with you and uh, like absolutely funding maintenance and 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 safety safety is the utmost uh, considered factor there thank you so Number much one, thank, you. thank you so much Ed, and thank you madam chair for the opportunity thank you senator Tello senator Chris Duenas do you have any questions or comments at this time uh, just a few comments, um, Madam Chair. It's been a very uh, productive public hearing. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank you, Sijus Masi, for the opportunity for all of us uh, to to listen. I, I think uh, I want to thank uh, Hermi Keha, uh, you know, for obviously the economic impact, um, you know, review for us uh, here. And then, of course, uh, uh, Eddie um, um, Cruz has, has given us a, a real in-depth information with regard to the uh, engineering aspect and as well I, I want to thank DPW uh, for having their representative uh, ready to answer the question so um, seems like a lot of thorough work has been done Eddie I don't know if you were involved but I know in build up one there was a civilian military task force that was put together so hall roads are not really anything new uh, particularly when uh, the uh, uh, build up one was proposed I believe as director Ariola was discussing uh, the Agonia Bridge and several other improvements that have been done, particularly with regard to Route 1, uh, were a product of that um, of that workmanship going forward. Uh, so uh, just wanted to ask you that question real quick. Uh, that Because I think that, uh, you know, to, to focus and get the emphasis of this bill, I think, is, is the whole roads and, and, and understanding what, what that means with regard to these weight limits. So uh, were you a part of that? Other than that, it seems like you've really got this down in terms of uh, the engineering aspect. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't part of that group. But uh, being Guam, as small as it is, uh, they, they, they consulted me along the way and they asked me what I thought about it. And I've had many discussions with them and uh, we discussed many of the bridges. Um, as some of you may know, my dad used to own a major uh, equipment company. We hauled all the big transformers for the for GPA. I, I personally hauled the, the fast tracks all over the island, including the ones in Talafofo. Um, and so I know about these bridges. I know about hauling the refinery equipment to go, oh, the old Gorko, where we cross that small bridge next to the island equipment uh, facility there. And we had to shore them. I shored the one at USO personally as a young engineer when we first uh, moved some other equipment through there. And when Pacific uh, Trucking did some hauling of, of the uh, power generation to Dededo and Jigo, uh, along with the Japanese, we consulted uh, as far as using the trailers, the specialized equipment to move those. And so I, I took a personal part of shoring those bridges also, including the ones that were getting ready to reconstruct um, the one in, you know, on route one that the military is going to pay for. So that there's a lot of history there. And even though I wasn't an active participant, uh, 
I'm a lousy politician, to be honest with you. But but I'm part of Team Guam, and I want to see uh, projects that, that benefit us, and I want to protect our roads. I, I, I share Senator Brown's concern. You know, we live here. This is our road. Uh, we, we want safe highways. You know, what can we do to do it? You know, property is very finite and very costly. So we have to come up with compromises. It's not like in the mainland where we can just widen the freeway, you know. Uh, for many years, we've been asking to have a middle of the island, uh, basically a freeway going from one end to the other that can be hardened, that can take care of commerce and also take care of express travel from the north to the south. But unfortunately, you know, with real estate prices and the economy the way it is, we can't afford that. You know, everybody screams when they say, uh, when the senators propose to increase the, 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 the liquid fuel tax or, or the BPT or something to try to pay for things. But in reality, we've got to come up with a compromise. And actually, this, this bill 83-36 is a compromise because we tried to address everything, including the fines and the penalties and the fees. But it was just too much to pose at one time. And that's why we decided, well, we've got to do something about the haul roads because the construction is ongoing with the military. And we need to put some restrictions and some limits and give some flexibility to DPW to say, OK, this this load can't go this way. Or if you want to take this load, you need to give us some money to repair the manholes or whatever it is that it damages. And that's why I am concerned. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you for your questions. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me. Yeah, Eddie, I might uh, get a hold of you next week and spend some time with you after a session is done. I, I want to get some more information. But I, I think with the focus on the whole roads and this compromise, um, you know, we've got a sound proposal be uh, before us. Uh, I look forward to uh, the answer as well in terms of the clarification from Federal Highway. I think that's just important information for us. But uh, I appreciate the authors, uh, uh, both the authors work on this. and. I look forward to working it through the committee process. Eddie, thanks a lot, Hermie, thanks, and Madam Chair, excuse me. Okay, thank you, Senator Duenas. Um, I, I believe every senator has had a chance to uh, ask the questions of the panel, so I would like to invite now the main sponsor of the bill, uh, if she would like to have closing remarks at this time. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair, for the opportunity to close. I, I just want to state for the record is, We've been working on this bill for the last uh, 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 term and this term, I think it's important to realize that we come together working with the administration, working with DPW, working with my colleague, Senator Moreland and, and others uh, uh, like you to push uh, this measure forward. Um, some of the questions were, were, that were brought up, I, I even spoke today in my uh, opening statement about the possibility of the task force and bringing as we look at diversification, even looking at the task force of the of the transshipment task force to see how we can do to address uh, concerns that have been brought up. So this, I think, is a positive uh, bill moving forward. Again, it's got the um, support, again, of, of uh, uh, um, all of the stakeholders that uh, have come to the table. And I'm hoping that uh, we can move this uh, bill forward and maybe even uh, see how we can get it into this um, into this May session, uh, Madam Chair, as I know that we're going up into budget session, but I want to thank all the key players, uh, uh, the business stakeholders who literally have taken the time for months to, to literally try and work all the, the questions and the inquiries that have come our way to move this bill forward. So thank you. And again, to my co-sponsor, Senator James, thank you for, for not giving up. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I truly appreciate this hearing today. It was long awaited. Okay, thank you very much, Vice Speaker. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, Madam Chair, if I may, we, we are still getting the information from the federal side too. I just wanted to um, make sure that that uh, is for the record too, that we said we would wait to hear from the federal side. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Taigui. Um, moving along, we have on this, the uh, next item agenda is bill number 87-36 COR, which was introduced by myself, Mary Camacho Torres, Talina Cruz Nelson, and Tina Rose Munya Barnes, which is an act to add a new article four to chapter 73, division seven, title five Guam code annotated, 
and to amend section 6603C, article six, chapter six, title 11, Guam code annotated, and to further repeal section 6604, article six, chapter six, title 11, Guam code annotated, relative to authorizing asset forfeiture for the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency and to further establishing a customs local forfeiture account. I will um, begin by, as the main sponsor, by reading the um, an opening statement. Bill 87-36 COR seeks to stem the tide of drug abuse on Guam by generating additional revenue for our first line of defense. If enacted, the measure would authorize the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency to seize and forfeit property acquired in violation of local customs law. Currently, the CQA possesses limited statutory authority to asset forfeiture. While Guam Customs has received portions of proceeds through equitable sharing with federal enforcement partners, it is not granted a local procedure for seizing assets under the direct jurisdiction of their agency. Bill 87, the CQA, under Bill 87, the CQA would be granted administrative forfeiture similar to other laws, similar to law, other law enforcement bodies such as the Guam Police Department and the CNMI Division of Customs Services. The proceeds from these properties would then be set aside in a local asset fund to be utilized exclusively, exclusively by the agency. In the bill's fiscal note, the Bureau of Budget and Management Research concluded that authorizing forfeiture would have a positive impact on CQA in performing its duties. Revenue generated from the sale of seized properties would open the door for future hires of personnel, training, enhancement of facilities, purchasing of equipment and other needs. I want to thank Director Pareto and the Guam Customs team for working with me on this bill and also acknowledge the University of Guam Regional Public Policy Center for issuing their report on the state of the agency in 2019. Bill 87 is modeled after Yoji's recognition of this gap and their recommendation to establish a local asset fund. This measure is a result of their efforts as well as additional amendments that CQA, CQA felt were necessary. This measure could not be more timely. According to the 2020 National Drug Threat Assessment published by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, methamphetamine continues to be Guam's greatest threat with most of the illicit substances sent to criminal associates in Guam who sell the drug for very large profit margins. Last year, the CQA announced that it had intercepted more than 100 pounds of crystal methamphetamine to the tune of almost $7.5 million or about $150 per gram. And just a few weeks ago, 34 pounds of methamphetamine were found during search warrants of packages mailed to Guam over the past five months. But truthfully, we don't need these reports to confirm that illicit drugs are flooding our borders. The evidence is before us every day. We see it in the families torn apart by substance abuse, in the children stripped from their siblings and sent to foster care, and in the rising number of babies born addicted before they even breathed that first breath. In closing, I just wanna say that asset forfeiture is a powerful law enforcement tool to deprive criminals of ill-gotten assets and dismantle the supply of illicit drugs. As we set our sights on rebuilding the island in the wake of a tragic pandem pandemic, so too must our first line of defense be strengthened in the, in the fight against addiction. At this time, I would like to call on um, Director Ike Pareto if he'd like to offer some testimony. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Senator. Senator Nelson and members of the uh, hearing committee. My name is Ike Pareto and I'm the director for the Customs and Quarantine Agency. And before I begin, I would just like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify in support of Bill 87-36. The Customs and Quarantine Agency has the responsibility to protect the people of Guam by conducting inspections of arriving vessels, aircrafts, 
commercial merchandise, and any tangible product for individual, private, commercial, or government use. Customs officers are duly responsible for facilitating the lawful flow of people and goods, while at the same time preventing unauthorized entries and stopping illicit drugs and other contraband from entering our border. The proposed bill supports Customs Border Enforcement and gives CQA an important tool in our fight against border smuggling crimes. Asset forfeiture divest criminals of the ill-gotten money and resources they need to continue operating outside of the law. For a long time now, the federal government has employed this powerful tool to dismantle criminal organizations by denying them of resources used to continue their criminal enterprise. Asset forfeiture is critical to taking the profits out of the legal activity. Profit is the motivation for many crimes like drug trafficking and money laundering, and it is, form, it is from this enormous profit that criminal activities thrives and sustains. The use of traditional criminal sanctions of fines and imprisonment are inadequate to fight the enormously profitable trade in illegal drugs and other activity. Because even if one offender is imprisoned, the criminal activity continues. Criminals must not be allowed to enjoy the fruits of their illegal activity, which have contributed to the detriment of our society. Through passage of this bill, drug dealers, terrorists, and smugglers of prohibited articles and endangered species, and those who exploit intellectual property would experience the full impact of customs enforcement. Bill 87-36 will allow one customs to seize conveyances, currency, property, contraband, merchandise, and articles unlawful to possess. Items such as illegal drugs, prohibited imports, child pornography, materials, and smuggled goods will not find their way into our economy. With the forfeiture law, one customs can separate the criminals from his profits, thus removing the allure and incentive for others to commit similar crimes. The passage of this bill provides both a deterrent against crime and a form of punishment for criminal organizations. Finally, this bill will allow customs to keep forfeited proceeds from various purposes, such as law enforcement operations and investigations, training and education, upgrade law enforcement equipment, travel, and per diem, per diem to name a few. In closing, Senators, I would like to thank the committee again for the opportunity to testify before you today and kindly urge members of the legislature to support Bill 87-36. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Duas Maasi, Director Pareto, and again, Duas Maasi for your team, for their leadership and advocacy in working on what was a long-standing issue that I know Customs had wanted to address for many years. So, you know, with your leadership, sir, we're finally uh, addressing it, and I appreciate that as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Colonel Phil Tyron to provide testimony, if you so desire, sir. I will not be uh, providing testimony, Senator. Okay, thank you, Ty, uh, uh, Colonel. And also thank you for your leadership as well in working very closely with um, our committee on, on amending the bill uh, so that it suits the, the needs of customs and quarantine precisely. Thank you again. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite um, the vice speaker, one of the co-sponsors of this bill, uh, if she'd like to ask any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. At this time, I'd like to just make some uh, personal uh, comments and notes based on the presentation of, of this uh, bill number 87-36. And thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to be a co-sponsor. Chief Pareto, I know your team is there. Colonel Tyrone, thank you for continuing to, to work uh, with uh, us policymakers. And usually, um, 
when we look at uh, opportunities like that and creating something or emulating something that is already uh, in federal statute is how do we work, how do we emulate it and work it for our local uh, jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction and, and uh, as noted, if this uh, bill uh, gets passed into the law, um, making it known as the customs local forfeiture account and, and to set aside the proceeds from that, we know that this is going to help with training, uh, with the enhancement of the facilities, purchasing of equipment, and even personnel. And uh, you, you know, uh, Madam Chair, we don't even have to look far. Um, GPD has a uh, forfeiture fund that we can look uh, at. Um, I say this is based on, also on Chief uh, Pareto's comments. Uh, we need to weaken the, the criminal enterprises that thrive from uh, uh, jurisdictions uh, with uh, limited uh, um, uh, statutory authority. But I want to note to you that when we looked at the fiscal note, uh, BB Mar states the forfeiture uh, account would have a positive impact on the CQA, uh, Customs uh, and Quarantine, and in performing its duties. It should also be noted that this is currently a federal asset forfeiture account and is being utilized by CQA. Again, based on the director's uh, uh, comments, the local administrative component is, 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 is not there. Uh, BBMR also notes that without any additional information, they are unable to determine the amount of revenues this legislation would generate. You and I know, uh, Madam Chair, that, that uh, based on the criminal activity, it's usually what, what's ever seized, whether it be cash, whether it be uh, um, real property or personal assets, uh, I mean, personal uh, items or commodities that, that usually uh, ranges the price of what, what could go into the account uh, if, if this policy was set up. So I support the efforts. Uh, I think um, the only other comment that I would bring up is, is um, I think based on the federal component, has Guam ever received uh, um, funding uh, from the, the federal forfeiture account to assist in local activity for, for Guam customs? Yes, Senator. We have, uh, in fact, currently we do have an account with the uh, Federal uh, Department of Justice uh, uh, forfeiture and an equitable sharing account. We do have that currently, and we are uh, we are receiving uh, uh, our share of the profits that are being uh, seized uh, as it relates to to operations that we uh, share with the federal uh, law enforcement entities here in Guam. Uh, we do have uh, 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 equitable, share, equitable sharing with uh, HSI, uh, DEA, uh, ATF, and to include the U U.S. Postal Service. So, so if a, a local uh, administrative provision were to be included into statute and customs and quarantine were to uh, um, benefit from that, that would mean that all the forfeitures that's done here on the island of Guam personally, the funds would be, or, 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 yeah, the funds, the resources would remain here on Guam and not go anywhere else. Am I right? Wouldn't have to be shared with anybody. Is that a correct statement to say? Well, if if the the operation is conducted and and, and, and the way it happens here in Guam is at any time that we have uh, uh, any type of, of operation. Uh, we make an arrest at the airport and at any ports of entry. Uh, it depends uh, if the federal uh, law enforcement adopts the case, then it will fall under the DOJ uh, equitable sharing. And let me just say that uh, since I came in, 95% of all the cases that have been adopted are adopted by the federal entities. But I'm not saying that we cannot adopt uh, uh, any the cases locally uh, because if the federal refuses to adopt that case the local our local law enforcement uh, can come in and uh, the attorney general here in guam will adopt the case and of course all the assets that cease are seized for that particular operation will go directly to our uh, agency yes 
Thank you very much, Chief, and thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the opportunity to ask that and make the, my, my comments to the support of this legislation. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, I don't see Senator Chris Duenas on. Uh, Senator Chris, are you there? If not, um, Senator Jim Moylan, do you have any questions for the panel? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the testimony. Uh, Bill 8736, uh, it, it will be really helpful. I, I do, I am in support of this. I, I think we had to give as much support as we can to our customs authority. And this will reinforce our ability also to, um, you know, put money back, more back, more money back into the agency as, as well. And it kind of works hand in hand with our uh, public law 3612 when we're eventually getting our uh, stationary x-ray uh, scanning portal uh, built there as well. And, and this will be very helpful, uh, those things that were uh, found, and, and then we can uh, also collect those revenues from that. So I, I do support this bill, and I thank you for the testimony, and thank, the, thank you for authoring the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Uh, Senator Brown, do you have any comments or questions for the director? Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to inquire, I mean, is the customs uh, geared up to be able to um, address actually the transaction of, of whatever, you know, uh, merchandise or other things that you, you're able to obtain that's in violation of these laws? Are you able to process this store at uh, address? I don't know. What is the process under which, um, you know, the the material that you guys are, are getting as a result of this because of, you know, improper activity that's illegal or whatever that you, that falls under your jurisdiction. Are you able to, um, how are you going to translate that into funds that can go into your account? Who's going to, is this going to be bidded out? What's the process and do you have the storage capacity uh, to address this transaction? Well, Senator, let me, let me start out Senator by saying that uh, first of all, uh, should this law uh, become law, uh, the first thing we will need to do is establish rules and regulations uh, on, on how we're going to approach the uh, the uh, the intent of the law. And that's that's not an easy task, but you know we will look forward in in, in creating the the rules and regs. And uh, uh, currently, we do have uh, the template that we're using for uh, that it's being used by the federal uh, law enforcement. And, and that's going to be the starting point for, for the agency. Uh, in addition to that, the, the challenge for the agency right now is to ensure that I have the, the adequate uh, administrative support to, to conduct this process because it's, it's not an easy task to, to put together uh, the, uh, the rules and regs for this and, 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 and follow the procedures on how we, uh, we mitigate mitigate this process because a lot of this will 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 have to be uh, correlated with the attorney general and the prosecutor's office and that's where we need to start do now uh, if if some for example let's say and it's not uncommon to find this i mean especially if there's not consistent inspection of cargo uh, where someone can be bringing in a container and then they don't declare you know what's in it um, and they didn't pay the taxes on it and if customs finds it what happens to that? Because we had complaints in the past where, you know, customs may hold on to something, but then the owner may come back to pay the tax and they can't find the item that was taken. Uh, what is the process for that in the inventory? I mean, these complaints have come up in the past in terms of the inventory of ensuring that, you know, if we, if we do hold possession of it, if it's temporary, because someone needs to pay the tax on it to customs is one thing. Uh, other, of course, if it's illegal, uh, you know, something they're not supposed to be bringing in the island, of course, you can you can confiscate that. But how are we ensuring the proper um, custodial ownership of, of what happens? Because it's not an unusual accusation that's been made in the past. That sometimes these things disappear. I know in particular, there was one case with regards to the Taiwan consulate because they had a citizen that had brought in a bike that they did not declare. And it was a high-end bike. It cost over $1,000 dollars. And uh, when inquiries were made uh, as to where that bike went, uh, that bike, and again, this is not during your time, Mr. Director, so you don't have to worry about it, but uh, it does beg to question the process under which these things are taken and how are they held and how are they accounted for? So they're not disappearing. Uh, so the original owner could not come back uh, and was customs was not able to produce this very high-end bike 
that it took possession of. And so what is, you know, I'd like to know also what's the custody of this, because that can also include items that, you know, are, are falling under this forfeiture. What is the proper process to ensure uh, that this doesn't happen? Because it's happened in the past. And, and you know, we want to hope that all our government officials and customs officers and everyone's on the up and up and they don't get tempted. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves. We've had customs uh, inspectors that have been indicted and convicted. And that's happened in recent, uh, in recent history here. So uh, what is the process and procedure? I know you mentioned rules and regulations, but what process and procedures also are currently in place, irrelevant of even this, to ensure that there's a proper custody of uh, items that are, that are taken? Because some of these things are high end. I mean, there's value to it. Um, and unfortunately, we have just some people with sticky fingers that decide, oh, I want to take that home. And, you know, it ends up at my house. Maybe it's at my house. Uh, but what are the procedures in place so that there's a proper recording and a custody so we don't even have someone at the level of a consulate? And that's pretty high up in our government, right, to have a foreign consulate inquiring on behalf of one of their citizens of customs uh, why an item that was supposed to be held in the possession of customs disappeared. And that's just one example. So I, I just want to know what process do you have in place to protect the interests? Maybe people don't do it intentionally. They're not, you know, bringing illegal contraband, but they pro didn't properly declare an item in their container. Could have been household goods, whatever the case may be. Uh, but what 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 protective measures are put in place so that we ensure that you know items that are falling into the responsibility in the hands of customs are not, uh, you know, misused or taken. Uh, and, and we can't find it. And it's not maintained within the interest of the government and the possession of the government. Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, let me assure you that uh, uh, we do have a property evidence custodian uh, section here within the agency that's responsible for the accountability of all items that are seized at our borders. Now, this particular section uh, works directly under a certain division and uh, uh, all the items that are seized are properly recorded, are properly uh, identified, and are, are properly stored in a, uh, in a designated uh, uh, storage area. I can, I can attest to it that uh, I am, I am uh, satisfied with the current procedure that I have right now uh, in place, because I can tell you that yes, we are accountable for anything and everything that is seized at our borders and we have procedures in place to ensure that uh, uh, any interceptions that are, are being made at the port of entries are fully accounted for. Um, what happens to these items that you take possession of and how long are you required to hold on to them? I mean, I, I'm sure you don't have endless warehouse or storage capacity. What, what happens to these items? What eventually happens to them? Uh, well, let, let me give you an example for for items such as uh, intellectual property rights that are being seized at the borders. Uh, inventory is conducted. A uh, a uh, a letter sent to the the the, the individual that uh, that the items were taken from, and where and the the individual is advised of the the procedures that must be followed. Uh, with respect to why the items are being intercepted, uh, that also in itself uh, is recorded. And we work with the Attorney General's office insofar as uh, the requirements and the proceedings that need to take place uh, and, and how to move forward with the interception. And, and, and so the officers cannot just come up and say that, yes, we're, we have these items uh, for a certain period of time an inventory is conducted, and then we send a letter to the attorney general requesting the status of, of those items that have been seized and for them to provide the guidance as to uh, how to move forward with whatever interception that we're keeping within a certain period of time. Um, that'd be something be good, great to follow up and be aware of. I mean, some things were a little more public. We haven't seen it in a while. Maybe there, there's, you know, we're not seeing it imported, but, you know, where we see things like high-end purses, for example, brand names that, you know, you're going to sell at a boutique in Tumon, right? Um, you know, in, in the past, we've seen public displays of where these items are, are being destroyed. 
uh, to show as an example that, you know, efforts are made to to intercede and, and, you know, make sure this doesn't come into Guam. And then there's a public display that shows that these items are destroyed. It could also be CDs of music, for example, and not a lot of people use CDs anymore. But we've seen those public displays of showing evidence that, uh, you know, these items are being destroyed. Is there is that anything happened? I haven't seen it in recent years. Or is that less a problem now, seeing things like designer hind bags and shoes that you know, uh, of course, these companies are very protective and understandably so uh, of their product uh, that, that that has their name on it. But is that something you're seeing a trend of? And if so, I, you know, when's the last time we've had? Because it seems like many years since we've had a public showing of uh, destruction of these type of items. Well, we have several in our inventory right now. In fact, uh, just uh, within the last two weeks, we've been sending letters to the Attorney General office. Uh, requesting uh, re requesting the uh, the guidance on the disposition of those particular interceptions, and the attorney general will advise us accordingly as to what step to take, and that that's the procedures that we have uh, in place right now with the agency. During your time, have you had any anything like that where you're actually ordered to destroy, or or is that done by the company? Who who does the destruction of something like that, if it's determined that it's to be destroyed? Uh, is it the private company that takes possession? And well, I, I don't know why they would. That's not their product. It's just something where, it will, it will where they're the copying agency. their product. We will I'm be sorry. responsible of destroying okay. it. Okay. Once we get the guidance from the attorney general that uh, we have all the, uh, the the documentation that's that's needed to prove that it, it needs to go for destruction. I, I would like to ask, Madam Chair, I think it'd be helpful if we could just get from customs what their process is and their forms are, just so we can have some familiarity uh, with what the process is that the director uh, had outlined. I think it would be just helpful for reference. And then okay. also, if we get asked by anyone, it would be good that we can at least provide them or direct them how to get the proper information. I do have yeah. one last question in looking at the bill, and, and it's on page eight. Uh, we're talking about forfeiture issues related to customs, but then we go on to talk about the tax with regards to cigarette tax or taxing assessment here. Um, I just wanted to inquire um, why this section was included in this particular bill and talking about forfeiture. Well, there, uh, that question, um, you're talking specifically about section 6603C? Yes, yeah, towards the end, page eight of the bill. Right. Um, the reason that they did that is is right now the only forfeiture account is has to do with tobacco product. And so the, the bill is being amended, contemplating that we're now going to set up our own forfeiture account specific to customs and quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so the, it was necessary to amend that language to allow for, and I believe it is... Um, if you read the amendment, it, it it changes it to a taxable assessment as to the as opposed to the value of commodity, and then it also references um, the tax rate that right now is is um, applicable under Title Eleven, Article Six. The reason is right now the the forfeiture account that they're that they're relying on that is a shared forfeiture account with the federal um, agencies has to do specifically with tobacco products. So in, in creating our forfeiture account, um, our local customs forfeiture account, it, it contemplates a broader picture. So it has to, it has to carve out and uh, establish its own, um, its own taxable assessment um, rate. So that was the reason why that section was uh, amended because it has to, it right now deals also with forfeiture accounts. But that Madam was Chair, would, would this also apply to other, I mean, I don't know what else could be, you know, what else they're bringing in besides, uh, si you know, cigarette tobacco products, but would this same thing well, in terms of like the triple tax rate, is that going to be the same thing on other commodities or is it just I limited think, tobacco well, I think, products? I think what we have to be aware of is in the asset forfeiture proceedings, there's actually three types of asset forfeiture proceedings and it mirrors the federal, the criminal forfeiture that has its own processes and in, it involves uh, federal in, in government uh, or, in, or an indictment. And then there's a civil judicial asset forfeiture, which usually deals with you know, property associated with uh, illicit uh, 
uh, uh, items being brought into Guam, and then there's administrative forfeiture. So there's there's different tiers of forfeiture, different proceedings for how they're addressed and how they're held and how they're adjudicated. Um, but you know what we have to remember is is right now we we we're creating a local forfeiture account. So the parameters of that are laid out in Bill 87, and that's what we're discussing. So, you know, we right now, the only references that we can we can point to, if you want a better understanding of how this operates, is to look at the forfeiture account, account for example, the GPD has under Title 10. Um, and then also there's uh, the, the, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas similarly has a local forfeiture account for the customs and quarantine. So what we're attempting to do is create that exclusive forfeiture account that customs presently doesn't have the luxury of which will that GPD does um, and our neighboring island does. So that's so if you think about it as a brand new um, program for customs, then that will sort of take away all the uh, questions about the how and 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 why. Um, but you know, it, it. What we had to do is we had to repeal certain things in the statute that were too narrow uh, in order for this to play out, and and that's why those specific areas were either repealed or amended. But it all goes back to yeah. you know what you're talking about, and it is very broad, and there are three different types of forfeitures uh, to begin with. No, I, I appreciate the explanation. I just wanted to notice is, you know, I don't know what else is being brought in that may be improper, illegal, but I just wanted to know, are there other things? Would it be a similar tax rate also? Or is it just a tax rate established only for tobacco products? That was, a, that was my question. Yeah, are you so aware? Are there, are they going to be coming back, perhaps asking us to amend for other, how they're going to determine the value? Is that something that, um, you know, in terms of the fines, is that is that yeah. something they might come back with other items aside from tobacco products? Actually, you know? this is just for tobacco. This is this is a, a niche forfeiture account, but this this taxable rate is just for tobacco products. Okay, so it's possible when they they might come back for other items in terms of how uh, they might want to increase. I don't know what the current fines are on any of these other items, but is that something maybe the director is that something they might come back at a future time to said or do they need increase it since we're just you know this addresses tobacco products i appreciate the clarification but do we know if there are other items um what how are they determining the rate of other items not not at this time senator uh, uh but uh, uh we, they were specific about cigarettes because uh we have come across that particular uh uh interception and and, and let me have one of my officers explain probably okay. uh the, the, the approach to that okay uh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Brown. Uh, John Eric Mendiola with Customs. Uh, you know, we do anticipate that we may return to the legislative body and ask for assistance in, with addressing some of our uh, antiquated statutes that we have in place, as well as giving us we'll make, you know, further rulemaking authority so that we can identify certain things where we can actually assess fines too. Obviously, the tobacco um, language that's, that's being used to amend the, in this section actually addresses a part where in the in the existing language, the assessment of three times the value is determined by the officer. So by using the, the current tax table, it gives us a, a, a uniform, it will give the officers a uniform uh, basis to determine um, the three times the value that will be assessed on the importer who exceeds their personal exemption amount of tobacco products. So that's what particularly address. As far as okay. other items, yes. As is, far as and other by items, any chance, is is this a common thing? Are we finding with tobacco coming into Guam? Is it? I mean, I don't know. Are they? Is this a, a common problem we're finding coming into the island? The, the officers do encounter that, of course, with the the reduction in, in passenger flow uh, coming to the airport because of pandemic. Sure. Um, you know, uh, we would have to look at the stats, but you know, everything, uh, a lot of uh, passenger activity. Also, it's correlated with uh, the amount of seizures that we make. We would have to come back to, the, to let you know if currently okay. we're seizing a, uh, significant seizures. But in the past, our officers have been seizing tobacco products from residents uh, as well as travelers coming that have exceeded their amounts, personal okay. amounts. All right. Thank you very much, Director, and thank you for the comment. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask these questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Brown. Um, I don't see Senator, oh, Senator Tidigui, you're back. Uh, do you have any questions for the director? Um, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair, for the opportunity and uh, greatly appreciate the gentlemen that are here today. Um, thank you, uh, Director Pareto, for being here to answer our questions and sticking around for that. Um, I, you know, most of it was answered. Um, I do have a concern about where you're putting these, um, uh, like it, in, in cases of vehicle or any kind of other products that come in here illegally um, where you're storing it. So I did uh, have the opportunity to go with you on that tour at the port uh, to show an area that a uh, location where you do put things that are, are held. Um, but it, it is a small area, so that may be something you might be looking forward to. Um, so just one question, based on previous experiences, um, has Customs ever had any challenges with what, uh, with respect to seeking for, forfeiture assets that uh, the agency had a direct role in seizing? Have you had any experience or challenges with regards to that? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Senator, uh, a lot of these cases that uh, that are that are being brought forward are adopted by the federal side. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, if we we, we come across uh, uh, items at the at the postal uh, uh, facility uh, that needs to be seized, then the the the, the postal uh, federal inspectors will will take over and adopt the case and then they will proceed with the uh with the forfeiture proceedings uh likewise with dea uh the same thing will happen to include uh hsi uh we haven't really seen any uh, major uh issues with respect to forfeiture with from the local level because as i mentioned earlier a lot of our cases are being adopted by the federal law enforcement agencies but, but with this particular bill, uh, Bill 87-36, this will give us uh, the opportunity to work with our local uh, uh, law enforcement to include our local attorney general. Uh, that's where they will be uh, coming in and, and, and provi providing us the, uh, the guidance in, in so far as the, uh, the, uh, the forfeiture and any type of equitable sharing that needs to take place. But, but sure. currently, we haven't really had any problems because a lot of these cases are, are, are coming from the federal side. Okay, I see. Okay, well, well thank you so much for that. And thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tidigui. Yeah, and I just want to also um, mention, Director Pareto, one of the challenges that I know your agency has is that you have authority to seize, but you don't have um, asset forfeiture which is what we're aiming to do with this bill. Um, I don't have any closing comments. I just want to thank everybody um, for their participation, unless somebody from uh, Customs and Quarantine has any, any further remarks. Um, I will then consider Bill 87-36 heard by this committee. And we will now proceed with the third item on today's agenda, which is Bill number 83-36. 36, I'm sorry, bill number 59-36 COR. Excuse me, I am um, <laughs> I got my order out. Um, yes, uh, we are on bill number 59-36 COR, which was introduced by Senator James Moylan. And uh, if, I'm, if I would, uh, I'd like to invite Senator Moylan to introduce his bill and to make some uh, opening comments about it. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Bill 5936, uh, sponsored by myself, uh, along with co-sponsors, Senator Tony Duenas and Senator Chris Duenas as well. It's an act to add a new Article 4 to Chapter 73 of Title 5. Guam Code annotated, it's relative to establishing an interagency working group for the development of building build lease transfer plan for the construction of a custom satellite inspection holding and secure sterile facility area 
and the procurement of a stationary X-ray scanning portal. So uh, recently, um, Public Law 34112 gave four acres of property to construct a custom satellite inspection holding and secure sterile facility area. And this is all needed to enhance the screening and inspection efforts of the custom and quarantine uh, department. The screening area for invasive species entering into our island, along with the drug ep epidemic, the screening of illegal drugs and uh, controlled substances entering through our seaport. Unfortunately, as we know, we have some financial constraints and earmark earmarking of needed funds is, it could be some difficulty in constructing this facility. So a bill lease transfer is, is an effective means of uh, providing the private contractor finances to lease to the government of Guam and eventually to be handed over to the government of Guam for the ownership of the scanning machine. And in the build lease transfer, we'll, they'll be also responsible for the maintenance of the facility. So the intent again of this act is to develop an interagency working group to develop the build lease transfer or the BLT that will construct the custom satellite inspection holding and secure sterile facility. Uh, they'll also consider the cost and the funding mechanisms for this lease and the scope of responsibility that will eventually be submitted to the speaker in 90 days after this action is, after this bill is enacted. That's the goal of this legislation, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm looking forward to the uh, comments and testimonies provided. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Um, I would like to invite Director Pareto to provide testimony or any member of your agency at this time. Thank you, Senator. Again, uh, let me start out by, by, by thanking the committee for giving me the opportunity again to comment on this particular bill. Uh, let me start out by saying that CQ uh, A enforces both local and federal laws securing our borders and protecting all ports of entry and ensuring the physical, social and economic activity and economic security of Guam and the region. And let me just say that years ago at the Port Authority of Guam, warehouse number two was the designated sterile area in which freight held by customs was placed, inspected and cleared. Warehouse two has since been demolished and there is no definite need. And there is a definite need for custom centric sterile and controlled area in which proper security, sterility, and is centralized for conducting efficient inspections and follow-up customs enforcement actions that can be taken. Customs needs a secure and strictly controlled sterile area in which to operate. The areas needed, the area needs to be large enough to contain a standalone warehouse, customs offices, inspection areas, areas for isolation and mitigation, safety and security of containers, cargo, commodities, merchandise, vehicles, and other items that are held, with, are held waiting for further disposition or action by customs. Currently, CQA is in the planning and development stage of building a customs satellite inspection facility at the Port Authority of Guam at Harper Harbor. Harper Harbor. The container inspection facility will aid CQA in the fight against terrorism, invasive species, prohibited imports, illegal contraband, biosecurity threats to Guam, and to include the United States. The CFS would also enhance CQA's ability to enforce the laws and regulations that safeguard against threat of agriculture, economic, social, and environmental resources of Guam and the United States. Moreover, the facility will contribute the necessary function for the establishment of a comprehensive biosecurity program at the Guam ports of entry. This facility and its operational division will provide the level of protection necessary to maintain and enhance the valuable nature resources of Guam and the region. CQA 
has a small contingent of customs assigned to provide customs inspection service for all arriving vessels, cargoes, and passengers. In order to properly execute this part of CQA's mission and maximize our limited resources, a new inspection facility is critically needed. Finally, by having a customs facility adjacent to the port would ensure that cargo, freight, and containerized and containers can be properly secured. Inspection can be properly carried out and proper wash down and treatment can be applied. In addition to that, Senator, we would also like to recommend that the interagency uh, working group identify other funding mechanism that can be tapped to construct the proposed uh, container inspection facility. In closing, again, I would like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify in support of Bill 87-36. Thank you. Thank you, Director Pareto. Is there anyone else on your team that would like to testify, Director Pareto, or can we proceed to questions from the senators? Senator? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Senator, um, Senator, I'd just like to make uh, two comments. Uh, yes, um, One is Tyron. that, <clears throat> okay, I'm uh, Colonel Phil Tyron. I'm the, currently the acting chief. I'm in favor of this bill, um, but I did want to bring up two, uh, two comments. One is that Bill 8736 and Bill 5936 uh, mentioned that uh, they're going to add an Article 4. Depending on how these bills are passed, one will have to create an Article 4 and the other will have to create an Article 5. And we'd have to execute it. That's just a little technicality that I saw. Um, and the other is that I really uh, I like the intent of this bill because it returns the institutional competency of building and maintaining facilities to people who do that. And that customs by this bill uh, would be able to focus their institutional competencies on border enforcement and doing the job that we do best. And uh, those are just my two comments. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite um, Vice Speaker Gina Munya Barnes, if you have any questions. Senator, could I make a comment? Thank you very much. Um, uh, um, yes, uh, Senator, sure. uh, Vice Speaker, I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I rushed to recognize you, but there was an additional comment from Customs. Uh, do you mind yielding to them before I you don't ask? Don't mind at all. Thank okay. you, Vice Thank Speaker. Thank you very much. All right, uh, uh, Senator Torres and members of the committee. Uh, Senator Moylan, Adam Duenas for uh, introducing Bill uh, 6. Please state your name for the record before you proceed. Is, state your name for the record. My name is John Rick Vindiola. I'm with the Customs and Quarantine Agency. I provide, or I'm here to provide oral testimony in support of Bill 5936. And also, I know I didn't, uh, for some reason, we had a technical difficulty uh, a couple minutes ago on Bill 87-36 which I would like to state for the record that I am in support of. And I thank the Vice Speaker, Senator Nelson and, and uh, Senator Torres for introducing that will really help Guam Customs with uh, giving a important tool in our efforts and Customs efforts to advance our investigations, as well as to, uh, to address the uh, illegal activities that are, are crossing our border. Uh, Bill 5936, again, I am in support of. Um, I, I think it's a good idea, as what uh, Colonel Tyron had alluded to. It brings subject matter expertise to customs and our ability to move forward in building a facility that we can use for the custom to, customs intended purposes for safeguarding our borders and our commodities coming in. Um, it also brings in key factors, not only on expertise who have building expertise, but also uh, members from the government that have uh, the financial expertise uh, in moving forward on how best suited for the government to proceed forward in funding such a project such as this. I would do. I would like to um, uh, recommend though that we do add a section O on subsection 
73402 composition to include O uh, and including the Department of Public Works, who is, who is responsible for a lot of the, con uh, the, the building constructions and maintenance of government properties. Again, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to testify in support of Bill uh, 5936, as well as making my comments for Bill 8736. I am available for any questions or uh, any questions that the panel may have uh, for myself. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you, John. Rick, also, you've been a very valuable tool to the committee as well in terms of uh, your guidance and your your input. So we also appreciate the work that you've done uh, in this regard. So Sidus Masi, I'd like to then. I'd like to go back to vice speaker who I very rudely cut off. No, that, that's okay. Uh, uh, acting chair, I truly appreciate the information received by the customs and quarantine team. Uh, in this efforts of supporting this bill by our, um, our uh, Republican colleagues, I want to note that the, this bill, um, which establishes an interagency working group for key public sector entities authorized with the responsibility for this BLT, which is Build, Lease, and Transfer Plan to construct the customs uh, satellite uh, inspection holding and secured sterile facility area um, is uh, one that I can probably uh, literally support and and uh, because I believe that this will continue uh, the efforts in screening, um, you know, the containers and goods entering into our seaport. Uh, we talk about those gaps. You and I, Madam Chair, uh, did introduce legislation uh, last term uh, about uh, make giving uh, uh, literally the uh, the look at the manifest beforehand and just making sure that we try and, and make sure that we know what's coming in. So in this effort to support uh, customs in their quest, I think that this is a good bill moving forward. I do wanna note that uh, BBMR uh, uh, notes that there will not be any major impact to the government of Guam at this time. However, uh, they noted that funding would be identified for Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency to pay for the lease of the facility and the stationary x-ray uh, scanning portal and uh, the legislation as is does not appear to have a negative impact to the government of Guam at this time and uh, as you know uh, as a big advocate for customs and quarantine I think uh, giving them the necessary equipment the necessary training and tools I think that this is a um, great legislation moving uh, a good legislation moving forward um, in that achievement, I know that, uh, the facility would be built in the PD area, right? And, um, I'm just hoping that uh, with the opportunity to get the resources and, and the funds that we look at a, a combination of all from, whether it be from other, um, not just the lease back transfer program, but literally ascertaining how we can outfit uh, any of the equipment needed after the facility is built. And something I, I'd like to work at working with grant funding and even seeing if there's anything out there uh, from customs that uh, the ARP couldn't look at as supporting uh, based on uh, customs being a part of the frontline system. So maybe that question can be yielded to the chief or anybody in his team uh, about um, looking at once this facility is built, uh, any of the equipment uh, necessary, how could we, we look at outfitting it uh, for all its right intents and purposes? Steve for John Rick. Does anyone from Customs care to answer that? She's looking uh, prospectively. Senator, are you referring to a uh, funding source for the uh, for equipping the uh, the uh, inspection uh, container yeah, inspection the BLT, facility? Yeah. Is that the question? Yes, I mean uh, if 
Yes. Yes, that's something that we're pursuing, and and we're looking at grants uh, to include the uh, port security grant that uh, that we're looking at to to help us uh, identify uh, any funding uh, source that we can use to uh, to uh, towards uh, equipping the uh, container inspection station. So, Madam Chair, the reason why I brought up that question is because I want to make sure that when we build the facility, and and it gets outfitted that we have the opportunity to make sure that the implementation is inclusive of all the, the, the maintenance efforts, the operation efforts, the training efforts and all that. And like I said, uh, looking at grants and, and resources that need to come in additionally uh, from this uh, BLT uh, uh, effort is making sure that they have it no good that you you have a facility and then you have um how do you say dummy uh machines that look good but don't do the work inside so i just thought i'd bring that up for size because you know perhaps by speaker that's why we need to push for the forfeiture account you know just get those yeah. funds coming in from other than the their what their fees are and but no yeah it, it, well intended, and and I think uh, the director indicated that he that that is clearly his concern as well. So thank I you, Vice it. And like okay. I said, I thank the efforts of Senator Moylan, Senator Adams, Senator Duenas for putting this measure over, and maybe he can get some bipartisan support from the other side when this gets deliberated on four. Okay. So thank you, uh, Madam you. Chair, for that. Senator Senator Tidegui, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, for the opportunity. Um, and again, thank you for sticking through lunch on this, uh, Director Pareto. I know I snuck a few, few bites <laughs> while we were on this, so I'm not going to belabor this too long. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, this whole facility, we had an opportunity, and I thank you and the Customs uh, Strong uh, that took, took us out to the port to um, look at this area in which for the, uh, you intend to put the uh, custom satellite inspection holding and secured area facility. This is something that's been under your um, watch since you've gotten in. And I'm glad to see that it's moving forward, you know, and thanks to all your efforts, you know, in, in pushing this through. Um, this, this legislation, and, and I thank the um, Senator Barnes for mentioning or the fiscal note, because for me in any kind of legislation that comes up, I always look at the fiscal note. But the bill would not, um, I, and I wanted to finish off where she left off because it says the bill would not have any major impact to the government Guam at this time. However, the Bureau notes funding would, would need to be identified for the Guam Customs and Quarantine to pay for the lease facilities and, and um, x-ray screening porter. The legislature is, uh, as it does not appear to have negative impact on government Guam at this time. However, customs and quarantine may need financial support in the future for aforementioned purpose. And that being said, have you had the opportunity right now to uh, speak with the governor with regards to the ARP funding uh, to move this satellite uh, facility forward? I mean, we all we do recognize too that customs uh, through the special funds that are, are the ones supporting customs right now financially is do these special funds are showing a huge shortfall, almost $3 million moving forward, huge shortfall. Um, I mean, let alone for a bill that puts an interagency together, that's, that's nice and, and everything. I'm sure this is something you're already doing with all the agencies, Director Pareto. I know that you've worked with everybody from the Attorney General's office, which you do on a regular basis as well as other government agencies. And as a legislature, we're here to assist. But um, have you asked ARP, uh, the governor for some ARP funding for this facility? Uh, yeah, yes, Senator, I've, uh, I've uh, managed to meet with the governor and uh, uh, talk to the governor about the, uh, the funding mechanism for this particular uh, project. And, and she's uh, uh, assured me that she, she's looking uh, forward in, in making sure that we identify the appropriate uh, uh, funding to build this facility. Uh, we're working at this point in time, even with the clearinghouse, uh, we've submitted uh, all our, uh, our required uh, uh, documents uh, with regards to the container inspection station and, and the justification in, in trying to, to secure any type of, of federal funds that are coming our way. 
and so yes, the governor has has uh, uh, has, has made it clear that uh, he's making this also a pri priority in her administration. Director Preto, it's, if I'm not mistaken, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the funding that you're looking for on um, this facility is about 14 million. Is that correct? Uh, we started at 10, 10 million. That's the, 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 the first uh, uh, cost estimate that I've got, and that was uh, given to us by Public Works. Okay, but considering you know inflation and considering how much the cost, uh, cost of uh, construction is uh, nowadays, and it's rising every day, um, I heard about 14, so you're now looking at about 10 million. And, yeah. and you know, even in our um, proposal to the governor, uh, the letter that we sent our, our, I call the wish list from the legislature, we put substantial amount of funding uh, for customs and quarantine. Um, and hopefully some of that will be utilized because we do know the dire, uh, the dire need of funding you need to sustain yourself. Um, even regardless uh, of COVID, before even COVID happened, um, customs has always had an issue with funding. And um, so I greatly appreciate the move forward um, on this facility. Um, I, I don't think you need legislation to do that. You're doing it currently right now. Um, but with the, the last question I have is for the record, will, will the proposed working group require funding and administrative support? And if so, uh, how will these resources be provided if so? Is that a question directed to the yes, author? Of the director, bill? yes. Uh, no, to the director, since, you know, you read the, the proposed legislation and, um, you know, so basically again, I, I was, yeah, thank you. I, I, are you saying that uh, the working group that's uh, supposed to be uh, to be identified right. in this particular bill will require funding? Yes, for the, uh, will, will the proposed working group required funding and administrative support? And if so, will these resources, um, how will these resources be provided? Well, let, let, let me just say that uh, just within my agency itself, we do have a working group that's working towards the, uh, the, uh, the implementation of this particular project. I'm not sure as to, uh, to, to what extent do we need funding for the, the, the established uh, working group as it relates to the bill. So okay. I'm not yeah, clear on that. Okay, well, well, thank you so much for that. I mean, and, and it's good to hear that you already have a working group uh, right now working on this projects. And, and I greatly appreciate um, moving forward. Uh, don't let us stop you. <laughs> Keep up the good work and good luck to you. And, and I'm sure that any kind of funding coming away from the forfeiture or um, other avenues uh, will be very helpful to you. I greatly appreciate thank it. Thank you, Senator Ty Degree. Uh, Senator Brown, do you have any questions? Not so much a question, but I can, I concur with the director's uh, position that perhaps this legislation can be amended to look at other sources of funding. Um, you know, there's the Port Security Grant and other grants that can be looked at with regards to the scanning equipment, perhaps it could be incorporated to reduce the cost. Um, because ultimately, I mean, we don't know, I don't know what the price tag is going to be for this, um, you know, build transfer facility. This might be the best vehicle. I don't know. I mean, at the end, we wanted, we'd love to have the facility constructed, but what is the price tag uh, versus other source of financing or, or funding? And that's a challenge we have is really knowing what the, what the ultimate cost is going to be. And even if we could do this build transfer, uh, ultimately, what is the source of funding that, that can be able to pay for this facility over a long time? period of time. So I hope that that's something that can be considered uh, perhaps by the committee uh, before this bill is reported out. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Um, Senator Moylan, do you have any closing remarks on Bill 59-36? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the testimonies and, and the questions. Uh, Director, I, I appreciate we had the discussion about this bill and and how the importance of, of it assisting you uh, for the need for this legislation. Uh, otherwise, we, of course, we don't need to waste our time, uh, but this is, will be very helpful uh, for you um, by giving it the 90 day uh, due date. Uh, and the, the purpose of this again is to put together the interagency working group. 
which uh, we're expanding it to include letter O, uh, to include DPW. Um, but but like you said, you know we we can always talk to other agencies, and we don't have to uh, create a budget just to talk to other agencies, especially in a working group. Um, I think you have a lot of expertise there, John Rick there, and uh, Colonel Tyrone, uh that have really volunteered a lot of their time to uh, to assist in developing uh, your agency and and done uh, above and beyond what their work title uh, requires them to do. So. For, for the suggestion of uh, having some sort of funding just to establish a working group, I think is unnecessary. Um, uh, likewise, that this bill is important uh, because we just granted an extension of the property uh, for CQA to develop this uh, uh, building and to uh, put in the, uh, the scanning machine as well. And if we, don't, if we don't meet that deadline, which we extended for five years, then that property goes back. Uh, so we just we just finished uh, extending that deadline uh, because of the need of customs and, and how far you uh, have gone thus far. And in addition, this this bill also supports this necessary legislation supports 8736. Uh, we're going to find more forfeiture items that we can collect and and gain some uh, revenue uh, for customs and quarantine. Uh, so I, I thank you, uh, director and and your personnel there for uh, the colonels and the professionalism and uh, of your team and what this bill is going to do. It's basically when we're talking about funding, how much money we need. Well, this is what the plan is supposed to come up with. This is what the BLT is all about. You know what these experts, as John Rick so so put it so well, that they have a great idea of, of what this should look like and what it's supposed to do for the people of Guam. And the plan is going to consist of the costs and the funding mechanisms for this lease. And then we come back in 90 days to the, the speaker and said, here's our plan. And then it's up to us, the senators, uh, to provide that funding somehow. And the governor is in support of it as well. But, but let's see how this plan looks. Uh, and with the expertise of this team and, and the pro moving forward of this bill, uh, at least we've got a 90-day window that we can look at and we can focus on, which I believe the director supports as, as well as his team. Uh, so I, I thank you very much. And I also wanna to mention to the vice speaker, we get this bill on the floor, I'll be happy to include you as a co-sponsor. So thank you very much and, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Um, there being no further discussion on bills number 87-36 Bill number 59-36 and bill number 83-36. The Committee on Education, Self-Determination and Historic Preservation, Infrastructure, Border Safety, Federal and Foreign Affairs and Maritime Transportation will now adjourn this virtual public hearing. Today is May 18th, 2021. We began at 11 o'clock AM and we are adjourning this meeting at 1.38 PM. I wanna thank everybody for their participation today. And uh, we look forward to working on whatever uh, outstanding issues need to be provided to the committee. And so we will be reaching out to you, Director Pareto, uh, to follow up on any, any concerns or any questions that uh, the, uh, the committee members and, and those participating today, today had requested. And uh, we look forward to working towards the formulation of a committee report and uh, and getting this onto the session floor as expeditiously as we can. So on behalf of um, the chair, Senator Talina Nelson, um, I thank you again and I hereby call this order, this this meeting, public hearing adjourned. Thank you. everybody.